This video is on the filioque. It's on Eastern Orthodoxy versus Catholicism, and it's going to make a positive case for the filioque. So the filioque is about the eternal hypostatic origin of the Holy Spirit. The Eastern Orthodox position is that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father alone. This means only the Father communicates the divine essence to the Holy Spirit through spiration, which is unique to the Father alone. The Catholic position is that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. This means the Father and the Son communicates the divine essence to the Holy Spirit through one common principle of spiration. Now what about saying the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son? The Eastern Orthodox clarified their position of the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father through the Son at the Dogmatic Council of Blackerne. At the Dogmatic Council of Blackerne, the Eastern Orthodox condemned John Beckos, one of the patriarchs who reconciled with the Catholic Church at the Council of Second Leones, because he was convinced of the filioque. In their Thomas against Beckos, Canon 4, concerning through the Son, they say, quote, In certain texts of the Fathers, the phrase denotes the Spirit's shining forth and manifestation. Indeed, the very paraclete shines from and is manifest eternally through the Son, in the same way that light shines forth and is manifest through the intermediary of the Son's rays. It further denotes the bestowing, giving, and sending of the Spirit to us." End quote. So for Eastern Orthodox, through the Son can mean eternal manifestation, which is the eternal shining forth of the Spirit through the Son. Most Eastern Orthodox theologians equate eternal manifestation with energetic procession, which is the Holy Spirit's procession from the Father and the Son to manifest a divine energy eternally. The Council of Blackenay says this denotes the Spirit's shining forth and manifestation. Now there are two interpretations of eternal manifestation. The majority opinion of Eastern Orthodox theologians is that energetic procession is the same thing as eternal manifestation or the shining forth of the Holy Spirit. You see most Eastern Orthodox apologists online hold this view, such as J. Dyer and David the Real Med White. The second interpretation is a minority view, which is the fact that energetic procession is not the same thing as eternal manifestation. And so we will only deal with the first interpretation of eternal manifestation, which is that eternal manifestation is the same thing as energetic procession. Furthermore, for Eastern Orthodox, through the sun can mean economic procession, the Holy Spirit's activity of being sent in time and space from the Father through the Son, right? The Council of Blackerne says, it further denotes the bestowing, giving, and sending of the Spirit to us. Now at the Council of Blackerne, in the Tomos against Beckos, Canon 4, the Eastern Orthodox clarified what through the Son cannot mean. Concerning the phrase that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son, they say, quote, it does not, however, mean that it subsists through the Son and from the Son, and that it receives its being through Him and from Him. For this would mean that the Spirit has the Son as cause and source, exactly as it has the Father. Not to say that it has its cause and source more so from the Son than from the Father. For it is said that that from which existence is derived, likewise is believed to enrich the source and to be the cause of being. To those who believe and say such things, we pronounce the above resolution and judgment. We cut them off from the membership of the Orthodox, and we banish them from the flock of the Church of God. For there is no other hypostasis in the Trinity except the Father's, from which the existence and essence of the consubstantial, Son and Holy Spirit, is derived. End quote. And that's from Thomas against Beckos, Canon 5. So, for the Eastern Orthodox, through the Son cannot mean that the Holy Spirit receives the divine essence or his existence from the Son, or even from the Father through the Son. If someone asserts the Son plays any role in the Holy Spirit's reception of the divine essence, the dogmatically binding council of Blackerne will, quote, banish them from the flock of the Church of God. Now, what is the Catholic position on through the Son? Well, we have the Ecumenical Council of Florence in session 6, which says, quote, Texts were produced from divine scriptures and many authorities of Eastern and Western holy doctors, some saying the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, others saying the procession is from the Father through the Son. All were aiming at the same meaning in different words. The Greeks asserted that when they claim that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, they do not intend to exclude the Son, but because it seemed to them that the Latins assert that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, as from two principles and two spirations, they refrain from saying that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. The Latins asserted that they say the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, not with the intention of excluding the Father from being the source and principle of all deity, that is, of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, nor to imply that the Son does not receive from the Father, because the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Son, nor that they posit two principles or two spirations, but they assert that there is only one principle and one spiration of the Holy Spirit. So, for the Catholic position of from the Father through the Son, it's talking about hypostatic origination. We believe that the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father through the Son can refer to the eternal communication of the divine essence to the Holy Spirit from the Father and the Son. It can also be used with regards to the temporal manifestation of the persons as well. 
the Holy Spirit is sent from the Father through the Son. And so despite popular opinion, the Catholic position and the Eastern Orthodox position on the Filioque are dogmatically opposed. It's not a mere semantic distinction, but a substantial distinction. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 246 says, The Latin tradition of the Creed confesses that the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, Filioque. The Council of Florence in 1438 explains, The Holy Spirit is eternally from the Father and the Son. He has his nature and subsistence at once from the Father and the Son. He proceeds eternally from both as from one principle and through one spiration. And since the Father has through generation given to the only begotten Son everything that belongs to the Father, except being Father, the Son has also eternally from the Father, from whom he is eternally born, that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Son, end quote. Whereas the Eastern Orthodox position says, quote, it does not, however, mean that it subsists through the Son and from the Son, and that it receives its being through him and from him. For this would mean that the Spirit has a Son as cause and source, end quote. Tomos against Beckos, Canon 4. Furthermore, in the Synodicon of the Holy Spirit, the Eastern Orthodox pray, quote, To those who confess that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father alone, with no intermediary, just as the Son is begotten from the Father alone, with no intermediary, memory eternal. So we see that the Eastern Orthodox pray that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father alone in the same manner that the Son is begotten of the Father alone, with no intermediary. So the Son has no role in the communication of the divine essence to the Holy Spirit. And they also pray, quote, to those who say that the Holy Spirit proceeds and has his existence from the Father and the Son, that is, as God, there is one cause of procession and one principle, that is, both the Father and the Son together, and who by this teaching alienate the Holy Spirit from the Godhead, anathema. To summarize, Catholics believe that the Holy Spirit receives essence from the Father and the Son, whereas the Eastern Orthodox believe the Holy Spirit receives essence from the Father alone. And so dogmatically, the positions are in opposition with one another. And so in this video, we're going to work with the presupposition that either Catholicism or Eastern Orthodoxy is true. Now, most people who dig into church history have already come to this conclusion. Either I'm going to be Catholic or Eastern Orthodox. The main differences in teaching have to do with the filioque and the papacy. If we prove the filioque is true, then Catholicism is true. Objection. This is not a church dividing issue. I will agree that it's not a church dividing issue when it comes to the laity, as most don't even understand the intricacy of the debate, nor do they care. However, Catholic and Orthodox doctrine on the filioque are dogmatically opposed. The ecumenical filioque document from 2003 says, These differences, though subtle, are substantial, and the very weight of the theological tradition behind both of them makes them all the more difficult to reconcile theologically with each other. So showing the Holy Spirit receives essence from the Son would disprove the Eastern Orthodox position, because we know the Council of Blackerne, which is dogmatically binding, says, It does not, however, mean that it subsists through the Son and from the Son, and that it receives its being through him and from him, for this would mean that the Spirit has the Son as cause and source. So according to the Council of Blackerne, Thomas against Beckles Canon 4, if we even show that the Holy Spirit receives being or essence from the Son or through the Son, this would mean the Spirit has the Son as cause and source. So in other words, they affirm that the Son playing any role in the communication of the divine essence to the Holy Spirit entails the Florentine teaching of the Filioque. And so in this video, we will prove the Filioque using John 16, Revelation 22, 1, the synthesis of the Church Fathers, argument from the taxis of persons, showing that the economy reveals the imminent trinity, using the psychological analogy, refuting the essence energy's root distinction, and showing that the Filioque synthesizes theology and so much more. Argument 1. The Father gives all to the Son. Premise 1. The Father communicates all to the Son, except paternity. Premise 2. The Father spirates. Conclusion. Therefore the Son spirates. Premise 1. The Father communicates all to the Son, except paternity. Premise 2. The Father spirates. Conclusion. Therefore the Son spirates. If this is sound, then the filioque is true, because the Holy Spirit would proceed from both Father and Son. John 16 proves this argument. In John chapter 16, verses 13 to 15, we see Christ says, When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine, Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you, end quote. Once again, premise one says the father communicates all to the son except paternity. We see John 16 proves premise one. In John chapter 16, verse 15, we see all that the father has is mine. Because the father gives all to the son, all that the father has is the son's. Now, you might be wondering where this except paternity clause is from. Well, to maintain the distinctions of persons, the persons must have hypostatic properties or individual differences which constitute their personhood. So when Jesus says, all that the Father has is mine, it is implicit that he means everything except for paternity. Otherwise, the Father and Son would not be distinct persons, which is clearly false. But since Jesus refers to the Father as a distinct person, 
it's presupposed that there's distinct hypostatic qualities. Therefore, premise one is true. Now on to premise two, the father spirates. No one denies premise two. Both Eastern Orthodox and Catholic theologians agree that the Father spirates the Holy Spirit. Therefore, premise two is true. Conclusion. Therefore, the Son spirates. Does this conclusion follow, though? Before we show that the conclusion follows, and before we elaborate on an expanded version of this argument, we shall show that the Holy Scriptures prove that this conclusion does in fact follow. In case you do not believe the conclusion follows, John 16 tells us it does. Conclusion 3 is affirmed in John 16. In John chapter 16, verse 13, we see, quote, He will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, end quote. John chapter 16, verse 14 says, quote, He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine, end quote. Now, what is the Holy Spirit taking here? Well, he's taking what he hears, or knowledge, from the Son. John chapter 16 verse 15 says, quote, All that the Father has is mine, therefore I said that he will take what is mine, end quote. So we see that the Lord Jesus Christ affirms that the Holy Spirit receives from him because the Father has given all to the Son, right? Whatever he hears, he will speak. He will take what is mine. And the justification for this comes from John chapter 16 verse 15, All that the Father has is mine, right? Because the Father has given all things to the Son, the Son gives knowledge to the Holy Spirit. Objection. What if the taking, receiving, and hearing in John 16 is with regards to the economic trinity and not the imminent trinity? Well, let's define our terms first for those who are not aware of the distinction between the imminent and economic trinity. Economic trinity, or economia, is the relationship of God within time and space. It's the temporal missions where the divine persons are revealed. So this has to do with God external to himself, or ad extra. The imminent trinity, or theologia, is with regards to the inner life of the Trinity. It's about the eternal, essential, and ontological aspects of the Trinity. This has to do with God internal to himself, or ad intra. And so concerned with the imminent Trinity, we have the divine processions, the hypostatic origins, and the relations. So clearly the filioque is about the imminent Trinity, since this has to do with the internal life of God. The way the divine persons reveal themselves in salvation history is the economic Trinity. Revisiting the objection, the taking, receiving, and hearing that Christ is talking about is within the economic realm, right? Since this is happening in salvation history. Is the Holy Spirit receiving knowledge imminently or economically? We know the Holy Spirit does not gain knowledge economically. He's omniscient from all eternity. He does not learn things within time and space. The Holy Spirit is omniscient from the communication of the divine essence. Since he has the divine essence and is God, he is all-knowing from all eternity, meaning the Holy Spirit receives knowledge, or hears, by hypostatic origination, or receiving the divine essence, which is pure intellect. But the scriptures attest to the fact that the Holy Spirit is receiving knowledge from the Son, but the Holy Spirit only receives knowledge from receiving the divine essence. Therefore, the Holy Spirit receives the divine essence from the Son. And so this could only be the case if both Father and Son communicate the divine essence to the Holy Spirit meaning filioque, right? According to divine simplicity, everything in God is God. So God is all of his attributes. The divine essence is pure intellect. It is being. It is existence. So if the Holy Spirit receives knowledge from the Son, then he must receive being, essence, and existence from the Son, meaning the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. Objection. Christ gains knowledge in the economic realm. In Luke 2, 52, we see, And Jesus advanced in wisdom and age, and grace with God and men. Now, since Christ is incarnate, he can gain knowledge in the economic realm, according to his human nature. But his divine nature is omniscient from all eternity. Since the Holy Spirit is not an incarnate person, he cannot gain knowledge in the economic realm as if he was lacking or missing knowledge. The only way the Holy Spirit receives knowledge is by receiving the divine essence, which is pure intellect. So, the Holy Spirit's reception of knowledge from the Son means he receives the divine essence from the Son, proving the Son spirates as well. But that just means that both Father and Son spirate the Holy Spirit, which means the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, or filioque. We also see great doctors of the Holy Catholic Church make the same argument. Saint Bonaventure, in his commentary on the sentences, says, Again, the Spirit will glorify me because he will receive from me. From this authority, it is argued in this way. Everyone is all that he has, and everyone is all that he receives. But the Holy Spirit, since God is supremely simple, is all that God has. Therefore, he is all that he receives. Therefore, if the Holy Spirit receives something from someone, he receives being. But from whom the Spirit receives being, from that one he proceeds. Therefore, if the Spirit receives something from the Son, he proceeds from the Son. If you say that to receive that being is in a temporal fashion, then it put forward against this that everything that receives something from someone temporally is changed, etc. And we see St. Alphonsus Liguori make this argument as well.
Quote, it is said, therefore, that he receives from the Son because he proceeds from him and from him receives by communication the nature and all the attributes of the Son. End quote. The History of Heresies in the Refutation, Refutation 4, Paragraph 5, Page 240. Objection. Buddhist claims that John 16 does not say the Holy Spirit receives hearing or knowledge from the Son, and he says the Spirit only receives knowledge from the Father. In the Mystagogy of the Holy Spirit, Book 222, he says, quote, What other hypostasis from whom the Spirit is said to receive could be meant other than the Father? Because it cannot be, as has been recently contended against God, that he receives from the Son. And it certainly cannot be from the Spirit, who himself does the receiving. End quote. According to Photius, John 16 cannot say that the Holy Spirit receives from the Son. Why is that? Well, Photius thinks that if the Holy Spirit is said to receive from the Son, then he must proceed from him, implying the filioque. But of course, Photius thinks the filioque is something that's not true. So Photius says John 16 is not about the Holy Spirit receiving from the Son. Let's revisit John 16. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The way Photius reads it is that all that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take knowledge from the Father alone, which is also mine, and declare it to you. Now the problem with Photius's interpretation is that it goes against the consensus of the church fathers. St. Epiphanius of Salamis is a saint both east and west. He says, quote, Christ is believed to be from the Father, God from God, and the Spirit to be from Christ, or indeed from both. As Christ says, who proceeds from the Father, John 15, 26, and he shall receive of mine, John 16, 14. St. Epiphanius is saying that the Son is from the Father alone, and the Spirit is from Christ and the Father. And his justification for this is that we see scripture say the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, and we also see scripture say that the Holy Spirit receives from the Son. Clearly, if St. Epiphanius deduced the Holy Spirit has hypostatic origin from Christ, from he shall receive a mine in John 16, 14, St. Epiphanius believes the knowledge the Holy Spirit receives is from the Son. Let's see what St. Hilary has to say. He's a saint both east and west. He lived from 310 to 367 AD. In On the Holy Trinity, Book 9, Paragraph 31, he says, quote, The only begotten, therefore, taught that he had all that the Father has, and that the Holy Spirit should receive of him. As he says, All things whatsoever the Father hath are mine. Therefore, I said, he shall take of mine. All that the Father hath are his, delivered and received. But these gifts do not degrade his divinity, since they give him the same attributes as the Father. End quote. Furthermore, in paragraph 73, he says, quote, That all things which the Father has are his. He alludes to the divine nature, and not to a joint ownership of gifts bestowed. For referring to his words that the Holy Spirit should take of his, he says, All things whatsoever the Father has are mine. Therefore, said I, he shall take of mine. That is, the Holy Spirit takes of his, but takes also of the Father's. And if he receives of the Father's, he receives also of his. End quote. Clearly, St. Hilary is asserting from John 16 that the Holy Spirit is receiving from both Father and Son, which Photius had to deny. Otherwise, it would contradict his monopatriotism. So it is clear that St. Hilary also holds the Catholic interpretation of John 16 that the Holy Spirit receives from the Son, and not Photius' interpretation that the Holy Spirit receives from the Father alone. Let's see what St. Ambrose of Milan has to say. He's a saint both east and west. He lived from 340 to 397 AD. He says, quote, All things that the Father has are mine, John 16, 15. Also of the Holy Spirit, saying that the Spirit is Christ's, and has received of Christ. As it is written, He shall receive of mine, and shall declare it unto you, John 16, 14. End quote. Sermon on the Giving Up of the Basilicas. St. Ambrose also holds the Catholic interpretation. St. Leo the Great, he's a saint both east and west. He lived from 400 to 461 AD. Here's what he has to say. Quote, For while the Son is the only begotten of the Father, and the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the Father and the Son, not in the way that every creature is the creature of the Father and the Son, but as living and having power with both, and eternally subsisting of that which is the Father and the Son. All things that the Father has are mine, Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall announce it to you. John 16. Sermon 75, part 3. So clearly, St. Leo is saying that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of both and subsists of that which is the Father and Son. And his justification is using John 16, indicating that he believes that the Holy Spirit receives from the Son as well. St. Athanasius says, quote, And indeed, the Lord himself said, The Spirit shall take of mine, and I will send him and to his disciples, receive the Holy Ghost. And if, as the Lord himself has said, the Spirit is his, and takes of his, and he sends it. End quote. Discourse Against the Arians, 1, chapter 12. St. Gregory of Nyssa says, 
Quote, he, the Holy Spirit, ever searches the deep things of God, ever receives from the Son. End quote. On the Holy Spirit against the Macedonians. St. Cyril of Jerusalem says, quote, And the Father indeed gives to the Son, and the Son shares with the Holy Ghost. For it is Jesus himself, not I, who says, All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and of the Holy Ghost, he says, When he, the Spirit of truth, shall come, and the rest, he shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. End quote. Catechetical Lecture 16. St. Cyril of Alexandria says, quote, In this way, then, the statement that his spirit receives something from the only begotten is wholly unimpeachable and cannot be cavilled at. For proceeding naturally as his attribute through him and having all that he has in its entirety, he is said to receive that which he has. End quote. On the Gospel according to John, Book 11, Chapter 1. So it is clear that the Church Fathers unanimously agree that the Holy Spirit receives from the Son, according to John 16. So, the Holy Spirit's reception of knowledge from the Son means he receives the divine essence from the Son, proving the Son spirates as well. But that just means that both Father and Son spirate the Holy Spirit, which means the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, or filioque. Objection! What if this is speaking about energetic procession or eternal manifestation? Alright, we shall now debunk the doctrine of eternal manifestation or energetic procession. Before we debunk the doctrine of eternal manifestation or energetic procession, just realize how ad hoc it is to use eternal manifestation or energetic procession. Even the Eastern Orthodox saint, Photius, says that the receiving in John 16 cannot be from the Son. And so he didn't even know about the doctrine of eternal manifestation or energetic procession. That wasn't even on his radar back then. All right, we're going to have to address the essence energy's real distinction. This is because the essence energy's real distinction is the entire basis or foundation for the doctrine of energetic procession or eternal manifestation, which a lot of neopalamite theologians espouse. Now, if we could undermine this basis, then we could actually undermine the appeals to energetic procession and eternal manifestation, thereby making our case for the filioque a lot easier to establish. And so we're just going to bite them right at the jugular and strike the essence energy's real distinction head on. The essence energy's real distinction has been advocated by many neopalamite theologians and YouTubers, such as J. Dyer, Vladimir Lasky, and John Mayendorf. Now, what is the essence energy's real distinction? The essence energy's real distinction is the belief that God's essence is really distinct from his energies. Now, this probably doesn't mean anything to you if you don't know what the terms mean, so let's break it down. According to the neopalamite, essence is what constitutes God's divinity. This is absolutely transcendent inaccessible, and imparticipable. All three persons of the Trinity have the divine essence. Essence answers, what are they? Energies are God's operations which shine forth and manifest his divinity. Energies communicate the divinity to the creature. These are knowable and participable. Energies answers the question, what is it that they are doing? Real distinction is a difference grounded in reality apart from the activity of thinking. So a pear and an apple are really distinct because even if I'm not thinking, they are not the same thing. And a real distinction is opposed to a merely conceptual distinction. A merely conceptual distinction is a difference that's not grounded in the object, rather a difference that actually emerges from the activity of thinking. Say, for example, Batman and Bruce Wayne. The terms are conceptually distinct because through the activity of thinking, we make a difference between Batman and Bruce Wayne. But in reality, they are identified with one and the same object. All right, so what are the commitments of the essence energy's real distinction? Well, the first one is that the essence and the energies are not identical, right? That's what really distinct means. The second is that the energies are fully divine. The energies are fully God. We could call these operations that manifest God's divinity, God himself. They could also divinize and ground the process of theosis. See the Barlam debates. The energies are uncreated, they're eternal, they're mutable, and they manifest God in time and space. So the light of Mount Tabor and the burning bush in Exodus, according to the Neopalamite theologians, are these uncreated divine energies. So they're uncreated, they're fully divine, yet they still change within time and space. And the last commitment is that the essence infinitely transcends the energies. Whereas the essence is unknowable, the energies are knowable. Whereas the essence is imparticipable, the energies are participable. And so the essence energy's real distinction has these four commitments. Now, when you see the Neopalamite proof text for the essence energy's real distinction, you have to ask yourself, are these four commitments necessitated by the text being deployed? Because a lot of the times, the text that the Neopalamites use to try to prove the essence energy's real distinction might commit you to one or two of these commitments. But most of the time, they will never commit you to all four of the commitments at once. So, so energies just means activities or operations. And according to even St. Thomas Aquinas, 
we could talk about the operations passively considered versus actively considered. Actively considered, the operations is simply the divine will and the divine essence. Passively considered, the operations are the effects. We could talk about God's activities qua his effects of those activities. All right, so we will logically demonstrate the impossibility of the neo project of the essence energy's real distinction. We shall show that the essence energy's real distinction will either force the neo into positing a composite god, or they will have to reject the four commitments of the essence energy's real distinction. So the first question is, how does one establish a real distinction between thing A and essence B? Does thing A have essence B? If we say yes, then thing A would have to be composed to be really distinct from essence B. If we say no, then thing A is already really distinct from essence B since it lacks the essence, therefore it's non-identical with it. Why does thing A have to be composed if it has essence B to be really distinct from it? If thing A has essence B, thing A can only be distinct from essence B by having a non-essential feature. Why? A simple proof by contradiction will help us understand. Assume the opposite. If thing A had no distinctions from essence B, it would simply be essence B. So for thing A to be really distinct from essence B, it would need to have a non-essential feature, meaning thing A would be composed of essence B plus some non-essential feature to be really distinct from essence B. For example, St. John is really distinct from the essence of humanity. So St. John is thing A, and essence B is the essence of humanity. St. John is really different from the essence of humanity. Now why is that? Well, what is St. John? St. John is a composite of the essence of humanity plus an act of existence plus matter plus form, right? And so St. John is really distinct from the essence of humanity because he's a composition of the essence of humanity and non-essential features. In other words, he's more than just the human essence. And so we see that St. John is thing A, and he's really distinct from the essence of humanity, essence B, by way of composition. So we clearly see that thing A has essence B and is really distinct from essence B by being a composition of essence B and non-essential features. Now we revisit the question, does thing A have essence B? If we say yes, thing A would have to be composed to be really distinct from essence B. If we say no, then thing A is already distinct from essence B since it lacks the essence. For the essence energy's real distinction, we ask the question, do the energies possess the divine essence? If we say yes, then the energies now have the divine essence, but we need some non-essential features to ground the real distinction between the energies and the divine essence, meaning God is now composed. Now, if you say no, that means the energies now lack the divine essence and we cannot explain theosis and theophanies. Well, why is this? We know the divine essence is pure act. Now, if the energies lack the divine essence, that means they are not pure act. And if something is not pure act, then it's necessarily a mixture of act and potency. Anything that is a mixture of act and potency is limited, is finite, and therefore cannot be God. And so, if you say that the divine energies do not possess the divine essence, then you're contradicting palamite commitment of the divine energies being fully uncreated and fully God, right? And for justification of the division of being, that all being is divided either into pure act or a mixture of act and potency, go watch Mathoma's theology lecture series. So either you're going to accept the Neopalamite teaching and get a composite god, or you're going to reject the Neopalamite teaching and get created effects or created energies, which is the very thing you're trying to avoid in the Barlam debate. And so from here, we show that the essence energy's real distinction either entails a composite god, or you're going to have to reject the commitments of the essence energy's real distinction, such as the energies being fully divine, uncreated, being fully god, eternal, mutable, and manifesting god in time and space. But this just undermines your own theology. Okay, now a common objection you always hear is that distinction does not entail division or composition. Right. So the argument basically goes as follows. The persons are really distinct from each other, but they're not composed. Therefore, the essence energy's real distinction does not lead to composition. Now this sounds good at first, but if you actually do the metaphysics and understand Trinitarian theology, you recognize that this objection is really weak and does not hold for the essence energy's real distinction. So the first thing we have to talk about is the real distinction between persons. We believe that the real distinctions exist between persons and the unity is in the essence. Catechism paragraph 253 says, In the words of the Fourth Lateran Council, Each of the persons is that supreme reality, the divine substance, essence, or nature. Paragraph 255 says, the divine persons are relative to one another because it does not divide the divine unity. The real distinction of the persons from one another resides solely in the relationships which relate them to one another. So comparing the essence energy's distinction to the distinctions of the persons is a false comparison because each person is fully the divine essence. There's not a real distinction between person and essence. There's only a real distinction between the persons and each other. The persons are only distinct by their relations of opposition or relations of origins to each other. 
On the other hand, the neo palamite argues that there's a real distinction between essence and energies, and so this is a false comparison. We said that in order to ground a real distinction between essence and energies, you're gonna need composition. You're gonna need some non-essential features to ground this distinction. We believe there is no real distinction between person and nature. There's only real distinction between person and person by relations, and so it does not lead to composition. But anyone who's arguing that the essence and energies are really distinct will be led to composition in the Godhead. There's an asymmetry because we're making different claims. Now let's actually examine what grounds the real distinction between the persons and show how this cannot be used to ground the essence energy's real distinction and how our argument before holds. All right, so distinction does not entail composition is only true for the divine productions. Since the divine productions are imminent processions analogous to action passion relations. All right, this sounds very complex, but let's break it down. So we distinguish between two types of action passion relations. We have transient action passion relations which are actions external to the agent. So think of a puncher punching the punched. So there's a real distinction between the agent acting, the puncher, and the recipient of the action, the punched. So the transient action of punching itself results in two correlative distinct terms, the agent and the recipient, right? The puncher punches the punched. The punch is the action, the puncher is the agent acting, and the punched is the recipient of the action. And so we have agent, action, and recipient. And there's a real distinction between the correlative terms of puncher and punched because there's a relation of opposition between the two, right? Even if you punch yourself, there's still a real distinction between the active point of contact, your fist, and the passive point of contact, your face. The puncher and punch are distinct. Thus, this transient action-passion relation still results in a real distinction between correlative terms. Now, the other type of action-passion relation is an imminent or internal action-passion relation. And so these are types of actions that remain in the agent acting. So a thinker thinking a thought. There's a real distinction between the agent acting, right, the thinker, and the internal product of the action, the thought. The thought remains in the agent. The thought remains in the thinker, but the thought is really distinct from the thinker. And the action of thinking is the imminent or internal action that produces the two correlative terms of thinker and thought. And so in this type of action-passion relation, we have an internal action that remains in the agent that has two distinct correlative terms, the agent producing, the thinker, and the produced term, the thought. And so because thinker and thought, and agent producing and produced term are relatively opposed, they're not reducible to one and the same thing. All right, so how does this compare to the divine productions? Well, we'll use a psychological analogy to help understand the imminent divine processions. When we know something, we generate a concept or a word, right? I have a concept or self-image of myself, but the self-image is lacking. It's not who I fully am. It doesn't capture its own being. Now, on the other hand, the father is pure act and perfectly knows himself. And in perfectly knowing himself, he eternally generates his word or self-image that captures all that he is. So the word is all-knowing, all-loving, perfect, and fully captures the same exact pure act of existence that the father is. Yet the word is generated, whereas the father is ungenerated. And so this allows for a real distinction between the persons by their relations of opposition. And this real distinction by relations of opposition is grounded in this imminent production. Since the father's word captures his very identical essence, the father's word is substantially identical and not accidental like the human word. So the persons are all the same one pure act, but they're distinct qua relations. That which is generated is not that which is ungenerated. There's this incommunicable, irreducible distinction between the persons, yet they are still the same entity. They're still the same divine substance. So this imminent procession is analogous to an action-passion relation and it grounds a real distinction between the correlative terms, the persons, right? The father and the son, the ungenerated and the generated, while also allowing for numerical unity of essence. They are the exact same pure act, but they are distinct persons. And so since the divine production is the perfect communication of pure act, right? They're each the same God, each the same pure act, not different copies, but the same numerically one concrete divine essence. Each person is fully identical to the same pure act. So there's unity in essence, but distinction in persons. Now, given that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all the same pure act, there's no composition. Why? Since pure act is without parts. Pure act has no composition of potency in act. It's just pure act. So there's no parts. The persons are not parts of God. Rather, each person is fully the one true God. But each person is really distinct from each other because of their relations or their directedness towards each other. Right? The Father is not the Son, nor is he the Holy Spirit. The Son is not the Father, nor is he the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is not the Father, nor is he the Son. Why? Because the Father is from no one, the Son is from the Father, and the Holy Spirit is from the Father and the Son. Therefore, they are directed, opposed to each other. And so all persons are the same pure act, 
and pure act has no parts, so the distinctions of persons in no way leads to composition. The imminent productions only establish a real distinction between persons with each other, not between the person and the divine essence. Each person is fully the same god, but they are not the same person. They are distinct persons. So although person and nature are virtually distinct and have different modes of signification, as person is relative and nature is absolute, each person is fully the divine nature. And so there is no real distinction between person and nature. And that's why the distinction of persons does not entail a composition. We actually have to ground and establish the real distinctions and examine if it leads a composition or not. Now for the neo palamites they believe that there's a real distinction between essence and energies. In, in order for the energies to be really distinct from the essence and possess the essence, there has to be some distinguishing feature. And this distinguishing feature has to be a non-essential attribute. Now this just means that the energies would be a composition of the divine essence plus non-essential attributes, meaning there would be composition in the Godhead. So distinction does not entail composition is true for the divine productions, since there's no real distinction between person and nature, there's only a virtual distinction. But for the Neopalamites who claim that the essence is really distinct from the energies and that the energies possess the essence, that does lead to composition in the Godhead, as we proved earlier. So when the Neopalamite says distinction does not entail composition, they're wrong when it comes to the essence energy's real distinction. They actually have to ground the real distinction. They actually have to do the metaphysics and explain why it doesn't lead to composition. But we proved that it does. Now after debunking the Neopalamite claims, they're immediately going to object and say, your relational Augustinian model of the Trinity is just clearly wrong. Here many Eastern Orthodox apologists claim that the Cappadocian hypostatic properties model of the Trinity is actually the correct model and the relational Augustinian model of the Trinity is wrong. Right? So they'll prefer Cappadocian theology over Augustinian theology and put them in dialectical tension. Now if you actually understand proper Trinitarian theology, you recognize that these two models are not in opposition with one another. The relational model and the hypostatic properties model are two perspectives of viewing the same one trinity. I like to say that the relational model of the trinity is a dynamic view of the trinity, whereas the hypostatic model of the trinity is a static view. But both the relational model and the hypostatic model are in unison with one another. They explain the same one trinity. Before we explain any further, let's show that the Greek fathers did not view the two models in opposition, like modern Eastern Orthodox apologists. Saint Gregory Nazianzen is a saint of both East and West. In Oration 29, 16, he says, quote, But it is the name of the relation in which the Father stands to the Son, and the Son to the Father. For as with us, these names make known a genuine and intimate relation. So in the case before us too, they denote an identity of nature between him that is begotten and him that begets. End quote. So we see that the relations allow for a real distinction between the persons, but identity and nature, meaning the Father and the Son are really distinct by their relations of opposition, but both are the exact same pure act of existence. So each person is fully the supreme being, meaning person is only virtually distinct from nature, and person and nature are really identical, but each person is really distinct from the other person by their real relations of opposition. In Oration 31, 9, he says, quote, their mutual relations one to another has caused the difference of their names. For indeed, it is not some deficiency in the son which prevents his being father, for sonship is not a deficiency, and yet he is not father. According to this line of argument, there must be some deficiency in the father in respect to his not being son, for the father is not son, and yet this is not due to either deficiency or subjection of essence. But the very fact of being unbegotten or begotten or proceeding has given the name of father to the first, of the son to the second, and of the third him of whom we are speaking of the Holy Ghost, that the distinction of the three persons may be preserved in the one nature and dignity of the Godhead." End quote. So once again, we see that St. Gregory Nanzianzus describes the mutual relations as grounding the distinctions of persons, while also recognizing you can assert the same truth through the hypostatic properties of being unbegotten, begotten, and proceeding. This is because the relations and hypostatic properties are two views of the imminent communication of the numerically one divine essence. The relational model emphasizes the imminent processions and their mutual references, whereas the hypostatic properties model describes a static view of these processions. So St. Gregory Nanzianzen is clearly in line with the Thomistic doctrine. In Oration 30, he says, quote, And he is called the Word because he is related to the Father as Word to Mind, not only on account of his passionless generation, but also because of the union and of his declaratory function. Perhaps, too, this relation might be compared to that between the definition and the thing defined since this is also called Logos. Clearly, St. Gregory Nazianzen is using the psychological analogy, asserting the sun is the word of the mind, or the infinite object produced through an intellectual emanation, showing the psychological analogy is used by the Cappadocian Fathers as well. In Oration 30, 20, he says, quote, And the image as one of substance with him, and because he is of the Father and not the Father of him, 
for this is of the nature of an image, to be the reproduction of its archetype, and of that whose name it bears, only that there is more here. For in ordinary language, an image is a motionless representation of that which has motion. But in this case, it is the living reproduction of the living one, and is more exactly like than was Seth to Adam, or any son to his father. For such is the nature of simple existences, that is, it is not correct to say of them that they are like in one particular and unlike in another, but they are a complete resemblance and should rather be called identical than like. End quote. So once again, we see father and son are identical in substance, meaning they are the exact same pure act, right? Person and nature are only virtually distinct. They're not two copies of pure act. The divine essence is a concrete primary substance. There's numerically one divine essence. It's not a generic universal. Like, but the distinctions of persons emerges from their relations of opposition. It says, he's of the father and not the father of him. The son is of the father and not the father of him. And by this relation of opposition, they are distinct. St. Basil the Great in Against Eunomius 2 says, quote, The divinity is common, but the paternity and the filiation are properties. And combining the two elements, the common and the proper, brings about in us the comprehension of the truth. Thus, when we want to speak of an unbegotten light, we think of the Father. And when we want to speak of a begotten light, we conceive of the notion of the Son. As light and light, there is no opposition between them. But as begotten and unbegotten, one considers them under the aspect of their opposition. The properties effectively have the character of showing the alterity within the identity of substance. The properties are distinguished from one another by opposing themselves, but they do not divide the unity of the substance." End quote. We see St. Basil the Great clearly showing the distinction of persons by relations of opposition. Right, The term he uses when translated to Latin is oppositio, the same exact term used by the scholastics. And I got that little hint from Eric Ybarro's book on the filioque. Showing that his view of the hypostatic properties are not divorced from the doctrine of relations. Rather, the hypostatic properties are grounded in relations of opposition. Furthermore, he says there are two modes of predication, common and proper. Under the analysis of substance, that is, under the analysis of light and light, they are identical to the same pure act. But under the analysis of the relations, unbegotten, begotten, they are really distinct. Which is why he says, the properties are distinguished from one another by opposing themselves but they do not divide the unity of the substance. Because the persons are distinct qua relations of opposition, and the divine processions are the communication of the numerically one pure act of existence, each person is fully the same exact pure act, and therefore there is no division or composition of substance. But because they are distinct qua their relations, they are really distinct. And so we see that the hypostatic properties are grounded in relations of opposition. Here's a Cappadocian father exactly making our point. St. Gregory of Nyssa on Not Three Gods says, quote, we do not deny the difference in respect of cause and that which is caused, by which alone we apprehend that one person is distinguished from another. By a belief, that is, that one is the cause and another is of the cause. And again, in that which is of the cause, we recognize another distinction. For one is directly from the first cause, and another by that which is directly from the first cause. So that the attribute of being only begotten abides without doubt in the Son. And the interposition of the Son while it guards his attribute of being only begotten, does not shut out the spirit from his relation by way of nature to the Father. End quote. So we see the persons are only distinguished by their relations of opposition. As St. Gregory of Nyssa says, quote, One is the cause, and another is of the cause. So there is an irreducible distinction between producing term and produced term, like we previously said. And from the fact that the relations of opposition are the only reason the persons are differentiated, we see he affirms that the Son is from the Father, as he says, for one is directly from the first cause, and the Holy Spirit is from the Father and the Son. And he says, and another by that which is directly from the first cause. Right? That which is directly from the first cause is the Son. And if the Holy Spirit is by that which is directly from the first cause, that means the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. Clearly, this is about the Holy Spirit and why he's a unique person. And so this is about hypostatic properties of the persons and about or about the divine processions. Meaning, St. Gregory affirms the Son actively aspires to the Holy Spirit, and he does so based off of the doctrine of relative opposition. This is why he says, And the interposition of the Son, while it guards his attribute of being only begotten, does not shut out the Spirit from his relation by way of nature to the Father. This simply means the Son actively aspiring the Holy Spirit grounds the real distinction between Son and Spirit, but the Spirit is still related by nature to the Father since he proceeds from both Father and Son, filioque. The entire context is about the hypostatic differences and about the divine processions. So this is about the communication of the divine essence, not about energies. Furthermore, he even says 
This relation is by way of nature, which the neo palamite thinks is really distinct from the energies. So no, this is not about energetic procession, and no, you, you cannot sneak your way out of this. We have St. Cyril, who says, quote, The relative names signify each other mutually, and both produce knowledge of the other. For father is a relative name, and so is the son, end quote. So we see that mutual relations allow for a distinction in persons, which is simply what the doctrine of relations of oppositions describe. St. Augustine on On the Trinity, Book 5, Chapter 14 says, quote, But in their mutual relation to one another, in the Trinity itself, if the begetter is a beginning in relation to that which he begets, the Father is a beginning in relation to the Son. So clearly, he's saying that the divine processions show a mutual relation, begetter and begotten, that is, a relation of opposition. In Chapter 12, he says, quote, but whereas, in the same trinity, some things severally are specially predicated, they are in no way said in reference to themselves in themselves, but either in mutual reference or in respect to the creature. And therefore, it is manifest that such things are spoken relatively, not in the way of substance." End quote. So St. Augustine also affirms that there are two modes of predication. We have relative predicates, and we have substantial predicates, or predicates common to all three persons. And concerning the divine processions, those are relative predicates. So they could apply to one or two persons. In Book 5, Chapter 5, Verse 6, he says, quote, But because the Father is not called the Father, except in that he has a Son, and the Son is not called Son, except that he has a Father, these things are not said according to substance, because each of them is not so called in relation to himself. But the terms are used reciprocally, and in relation each to the other. Nor yet according to accident, because both the being called the Father and the being called the Son is eternal and unchangeable to them. Wherefore, Although to be the Father and to be the Son is different, yet their substance is not different, because they are so called, not according to substance, but according to relation, which relation, however, is not accident, because it is not changeable." End quote. So we see the persons are really distinct by relations, or relations of opposition, and they are identical in substance, and we see that the relations are not accidents, meaning the relations are subsistent. The divine relations are only virtually distinct from the divine substance. As the divine substance is pure act, and the divine relations are all pure act, but they have two modes of signification. Even the arch-heretic Arius, who denied the divinity of Christ, said the following, which shows the doctrine of relations was used by Orthodox Trinitarians at the Nicene Debates. In Arius' writing to Pope St. Alexander I, he says, quote, For he is neither eternal nor co-eternal nor co-unbegotten with the Father, nor does he have his being together with the Father, as some speak of relations. End quote. This is from Father Emery's book, Trinity, Church, and Human Person. So the doctrine of relations was used at the Council of Nicaea by Orthodox defenders of the Triune God against Arius, showing that this is clearly something that was taught by the Fathers, both East and West, from the very beginning. And the doctrine of relations is an Aristotelian category, which has simultaneous mutual opposed reference. So clearly, the doctrine of relations of opposition is something that is grounded in both East and West. And so anyone who tries to divorce the relational model from the hypostatic model does not actually understand Trinitarian theology, and they don't understand the Cappadocian Fathers. And this is why St. Thomas Aquinas is a great synthesizer of the East and the West, because he actually understands what he's talking about. He actually understands philosophy and metaphysics. He actually understands scripture. He actually understands the Church Fathers. And so he synthesizes them beautifully. And so we clearly demonstrated that the relational model of the Trinity is something that is true. The relational model and the hypostatic model of the Trinity are two views of the same one Trinity. Anyone who tries to divorce the relational model of the Trinity from the hypostatic model of the Trinity and put them in dialectical opposition does not actually understand Trinitarian theology. All right, so let's revisit the objection. The objection was distinction does not entail division, right? So the argument was that the persons are really distinct, but they're not composed. Therefore, the essence energy's distinction does not lead to composition. Well, we analyze this claim and realize that the distinction does not entail division for the persons due to the imminent divine processions which ground distinct relations while maintaining unity in essence. But this cannot apply to the essence energy's real distinction. Why? First reason, this would be giving the energies the divine processions and would be confusing them with the persons. You would have generated or spirated energies, which is clearly false. The second problem is that the imminent divine productions provide a real distinction between the persons who are really distinct relative to the other persons. But the imminent divine productions do not provide a real distinction between the persons and the divine essence. We say that the persons are each fully the divine essence, and that the persons are only really distinct from each other, and are only virtually distinct from the essence. So the doctrine of relations cannot help Neopalamites affirm a real distinction between the essence and the energies. So if you do the basic metaphysics, you will see that this objection does not help the Neopalamites. And so if we go back to our initial objection, we ask, do the energies possess the divine essence? If you say yes, 
the energies now have the divine essence, plus they will need some non-essential features to ground the distinction, meaning that God is now composed, and so you're led to a composite God. Now, if you say the energies lack the divine essence, that means the energies are not pure act. But if the energies are not pure act, they must be a composition of act and potency. But if they're a composition of act and potency, then they're not God, they're not divine, they're not uncreated. They would be limited, composite, finite, and now you can't explain theosis, theophanies, plus this contradicts Palamite teaching. So pick your poison. Do you want a composite God, or do you want to undermine your neo-Palamite commitments? There's a third way. Admit there's no essence, energies, real distinction, and undermine your neo-Palamite theology. Thomism is so much better than Neopalamism, because it's actually true. Now, why do I keep saying Neopalamism? Well, because there's a Neopalamite traditional Palamite real distinction. Your own Palamite saints disagree with you. Philotheos Kokinos is an Eastern Orthodox saint living in the 1300s. He was an ecumenical patriarch of Constantinople. He is regarded as a protector of Orthodoxy, along with Photius, Mark of Ephesus, and Palamas. Here's what he has to say about the essence energies distinction. Quote, According to the theologians and the fathers, the divine essence and the divine energy are two things, in the sense that it is proclaimed that they differ from each other not really, but conceptually, and that these two things are one thing, their unity in its turn being taken and proclaimed as existent, not conceptually, but really. End quote. Whoa! You're telling me Philotheos Kokinos, a protector of orthodoxy, is saying that the essence energy's distinction is not a real distinction, but only conceptual, and their unity is a real unity. Wait a second. Philotheos Kokinos was the theologian of official Palamism. He's the one who threw the anathemas at Barlam. Isn't he the one who wrote the Hagioretic Tome under the supervision and inspiration of Palamas, the one that taught official Palamite teachings? Isn't he the one who canonized Palamas and wrote the book on his life? So you're telling me, Kokinos was a student and friend of Gregory Palamas who helped construct the dogmatic Hagioretic Tome for the Palamite councils, and he is the one who standardized Palamite teaching? Yet he didn't believe in the essence energy's real distinction? That's exactly what I'm saying. And as we see, the essence energy's real distinction is an evolution of dogma, not something even held by the protectors of orthodoxy who compose the Palamite Council's documents. This is why Photius doesn't even know about the essence energy's real distinction. It's evolution of dogma. And this is why we have St. Gregory of Nyssa who says, quote, Yet there is nothing uncreated except the divine nature. End quote. Wait a second, Neo-Palamites claim that the energies are really distinct from the divine nature, but are also uncreated. St. Gregory of Nyssa says only the divine nature is uncreated. Let's see what St. Leo has to say. Quote, No man is truth, wisdom, justice, but many are partakers of truth, wisdom, and justice. But God alone is exempt from any participating, and anything which is in any degree worthily predicated of him is not an attribute, but his very essence. For in the unchangeable there is nothing added, but there is nothing lost, because to be is ever his peculiar property, and that is eternity. End quote. Wait a second, whatever is predicated of God is not just an attribute of him, but its very essence. But all of these Neopalamites are saying that whatever we predicate of God, we're predicating of his energies. Right? Remember Jay Dyer said that love is an energy of God. Existence is an energy of God. Existence even it's itself is an energy of God. Existence is not the divine essence. Wrong. St. Leo the Great says whatever we're predicating of God, that's about his essence. And so we have proved the Neopalamism, traditional Palamism, real distinction. We have showed that in order for the Neopalamite project to work, you're either going to lead to a composite God, or you're going to have to reject all the commitments of the Neopalamite project. We've also showed that your own Palamite saints, the defenders of orthodoxy, did not believe in the essence energy's real distinction. Now that we have debunked the essence energy's real distinction, this will make it so much easier for us to prove the filioque, as the essence energy's real distinction is a basis for the energetic procession, or eternal manifestation. Now that that's gone, we could also rule out eternal manifestation and energetic procession, and make it so much easier for us to prove the eternal hypostatic origination of the Holy Spirit from the Father and the Son. So, revisiting what we were talking about earlier, we said that John 16 shows that the Holy Spirit receives from the Son, and then we debunk the essence energy's real distinction. So, if the Holy Spirit receives knowledge from the Son, then he must receive being, essence, and existence from the Son, meaning the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. Now, let's acknowledge some more interesting biblical parallels. The first one is that the Father gives all authority to the Son. In Matthew 28, 18, we see, quote, And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. End quote. In Matthew eleven twenty seven, we see Jesus say, quote, All things have been handed over to me by my Father. End quote. The Son's reception of authority from the Father indicates that he receives the divine essence or has his hypostatic origin from the Father. All three persons in the Trinity are co equal and have the same authority. There's no gradation or subordination of authority. But the reception of authority is meant to just indicate 
the hypostatic origination of the persons. All right. St. John Chrysostom says, quote, All authority hath been given unto me by my Father, referring all to him that begat him, not as though of himself he were not sufficient, but to signify that he is a son and not unbegotten. End quote. Homily 39 on 1 Corinthians paragraph 11. So according to St. John Chrysostom, the son's reception of authority is to show something about his hypostatic origin and personal properties. St. Athanasius says, quote, He has said, was given unto me, and I received, and were delivered to me, only to show that he is not the Father, but the Father's word, and the eternal Son, who because of his likeness to the Father, has eternally what he has from him, and because he is the Son, he has from the Father what he has eternally. End quote. Discourse 3 against the Arians, chapter 27. Likewise, St. Athanasius says the Son's reception of authority reflects his hypostatic origin from the Father, since he is the eternal word of the Father. Now, John 16, 13 parallels John 5, 19 and John 12, 49. John 16, 13 says, quote, When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. End quote. John 5, 19 says, quote, Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his Father doing, because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. End quote. And John 12, 49 says, quote, For I have not spoken on my own authority. The Father who sent me has himself given me commandment what to say and what to speak. End quote. So we see both Son and Spirit do not speak on their own authority. Right, in John 16, 13, it says, He will not speak on his own authority. In John 5, 19, we see the Son can do nothing by himself. And in John 12, 49, we see, I've not spoken on my own authority. But the Son and the Spirit receive their authority to speak from another. Right, in John 16, 13, we see, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And in John 5, 19, we hear, he could do only what he sees his Father doing. And in John 12, 49, we see, the Father who sent me has himself given me commandment what to say and what to speak. We also see similarities in John eight twenty eight, which says, quote, so Jesus said, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak thus as the Father taught me. End quote. Now the reception of authority points to the reception of the divine essence or hypostatic origin. The Son receives authority and his speech from the Father, since he has his hypostatic origin from the Father. Here's what St. Augustine has to say on John 5.19. Quote, the Father then shows a thing which he does to the Son, in such wise that the Son sees all things in the Father, and is all things in the Father. For by seeing he was begotten, and by being begotten he sees. End quote. Tractate 21. So St. Augustine says the Son does whatever he sees the Father doing, because the Son is begotten of the Father. This quasi-dependency on sight is based on hypostatic origination. St. Hilary on John 5.19 says, quote, He says that the Son can do nothing but what he sees the Father do. He displays this nature which is his by birth, a nature which derives its power of action not from successive gifts of strength to do particular deeds, but from knowledge. By the action of the divine nature, he had come to share the subsistence of the divine nature, or in other words, he had been born as son from the Father, end quote. On the Trinity, Book 7, 17, quote, The next words are, For whatever things he, the Father, does, these also the Son likewise. This likewise is added to indicate his birth, whatsoever and same to indicate the true divinity of his nature. On the Trinity, Book 7, 18. Likewise, St. Hilary indicates the Son doing only what he sees the Father doing indicates that he is begotten or born of the Father. St. Cyril of Alexandria on John 8, 28 says, quote, Thus, therefore, does the only begotten himself here to affirm that he learned of the Father. For what he knows what he is because of the Father from whom he is, for he is light of light. This he said that he learnt of him, having a sort of untaught learning of God befitting works and words, from the own nature of him who begat him. End quote. Commentary on John 8.28. So according to St. Cyril of Alexandria, the Son learning from the Father indicates the Son received the all-knowing essence from the Father. That's what he meant by a sort of untaught learning, from the own nature of him who begat him. So, the reception of authority points to the reception of the divine essence or hypostatic origin, according to the Church Fathers. The Son receives authority in his speech and his actions from the Father, since he has his hypostatic origin from the Father. Now, revisiting John 16, we see, When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So we see the Holy Spirit receives authority and speech from the Father and the Son. The Spirit does not speak on his own authority, but speaks what is received from the Son, 
This is just like what we previously said. The Spirit receives authority from the Son since He's communicated the divine essence from the Father and the Son. In other words, the Spirit has hypostatic origination from the Father and the Son. This is why we see in John 16, 15, all that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said He would take what is mine, right? The Father giving all things to the Son is the justification or explanation why the Holy Spirit receives from the Son. That is to say, the only reason the Holy Spirit receives from the Son is because the Father has given all things, including spiration, to the Son. So, argument one is thoroughly proved by John 16. Premise one, the Father communicates all to the Son except paternity. Premise two, the Father spirates. Conclusion, therefore the Son spirates. That's why we see he would take what is mine. Therefore I said he would take what is mine. Why? Because the Father has given all to me. All that the Father has is mine. Before we go to formal arguments and objections, let's see some church fathers' interpretation of this. St. Augustine on Tractate 99 on John 16, 13, chapter 4 says, Accordingly, he shall not speak of himself because he is not of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. He shall hear of him from whom he proceeds. To him hearing is knowing, but knowing is being, as has been discussed above. Because then he is not of himself, but of him from whom he proceeds, and of whom he has essence, of him he has knowledge. From him, therefore, he has hearing, which is nothing else than knowledge. End quote. So St. Augustine says, He shall hear of him from whom he proceeds, and from whom he proceeds, of him he has essence, of him he has knowledge, from him therefore he has hearing. But John 16 says the Holy Spirit hears from Christ. So that must mean that he has knowledge from Christ and has essence from Christ and therefore proceeds from Christ. But the Council of Blackerne says that the Son cannot communicate the divine essence or the divine being to the Holy Spirit. But St. Augustine is saying that exact thing. And he says knowing is being and he has knowledge, therefore being from the Son. So St. Augustine is directly contradicting the Council of Blackernay, which is dogmatic for Eastern Orthodox. And that's because St. Augustine is a filioquist. In Tractate 99, Chapter 5, we see St. Augustine say, quote, And be not disturbed by the fact that the verb is put in the future tense, for it is not said, Whatsoever he has heard, or whatsoever he hears, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. For such hearing is everlasting, because the knowing is everlasting. But in the case of what is eternal, without beginning and without end, in whatever tense the verb is put, Whatever in the past or present or future, there is no falsehood thereby implied. The Holy Spirit, therefore, is always hearing because he always knows. Ergo, he both knew and knows and will know. And in the same way, he both heard and hears and will hear. For as we have already said, to him hearing is one with knowing, and knowing with him is one with being. For him, therefore, he heard and hears and will hear of whom he is, and of him he is from whom he proceeds. But the Holy Spirit proceeds not from the Father into the Son, and then proceeds from the Son to the work of the creature's sanctification, but he proceeds at the same time from both, although this the Father has given unto the Son, that he should proceed from him also, even as he proceeds from himself. And as little can we say that the Holy Spirit is not the life, seeing that the Father is the life, and that the Son is the life, in the same way as the Father, who has life in himself, has given to the Son also to have life in himself, so he has also given that life should proceed from him, even as it also proceeds from himself. But we come now to the words of the Lord that follow when he says, and he shall show you the things that come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore said I, that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. End quote. So we see St. Augustine makes this very argument that we made, and supports it with John 16, right? St. Augustine says, quote, He also given that life should proceed from him, even as it also proceeds from himself. The Father communicates all to the Son except paternity. The Father spirates. Therefore the Son spirates. And we see that this is an everlasting hearing. Therefore this is not an economy. And St. Augustine says that he proceeds from both at the same time, meaning both actively spirate. But there's a distinction in the mode of the spirative power. The Father has the spirative power of himself, and the Son is given the spirative power from the Father. He proceeds at the same time from both, although this the Father has given unto the Son, that he should proceed from him also, even as he proceeds from himself. This is why the Council of Florence says the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son is identical to the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father through the Son. The Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son, filioque, helps recognize that both are actively communicating the divine essence to the Holy Spirit, actively spirating. The Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father through the Son helps us recognize the communication of the spirit of power. The Father has the spirit of power of himself, and he gives that identical spirit of power to the Son. And so the Father and the Son hold the spirit of power in distinct manners, but it's the same numerically identical spirit of power, and they spire it with the exact identical spiration. St. Epiphanius of Salamis is a saint both East and West, living from 310 to 403 AD. He says the following, quote, Christ is believed to be from the Father, God from God, 
and the Spirit to be from Christ, or indeed from both, as Christ says, who proceeds from the Father, John 15, 26, and he shall receive of mine, John 16, 14, end quote. So clearly the context here is about hypostatic origin, as Christ is God from God, not by energies, nor by eternal manifestation, nor by economy, but by eternal generation or hypostatic origination. Likewise, the Holy Spirit is God from both by hypostatic origination. And he uses John 15, 26, who proceeds from the Father, which is read by the fathers as pertaining to hypostatic origin. And he equates that with he shall receive of mine. So in other words, St. Epiphanius of Salamis is saying that the Holy Spirit receives the divine essence from both Father and Son, and he's using John 16 to justify this. St. Isidore of Seville was a saint both East and West, living from 560 to 636 AD. He says, quote, The Holy Spirit is spoken of, however, as proceeding by the testimony of the Lord, saying, I have yet many things to say to you, but you cannot hear them now. But he, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, will come, and he shall receive of mine. He shall show everything to you. This Spirit, moreover, proceeds not only by its nature, but it proceeds always in ceaselessly performing the works of the Trinity. Between the Son who is born and the Holy Spirit who proceeds is this distinction, that the Son is born from one, the Holy Spirit proceeds from both. Therefore, the Apostle says, Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So clearly, this is talking about the hypostatic origin of the Holy Spirit, because the Son who is born is talking about the nativity or generation of the Son, and the Holy Spirit who proceeds is talking about his hypostatic origin. Now, the distinction between the Son's origin and the Holy Spirit's origin, according to St. Isidore, is that the Son is from one, whereas the Holy Spirit proceeds from both, meaning filioque. Now, how did St. Isidore derive the hypostatic filioque? Well, he used John 15, 26. He used John 16, where we see that he shall receive of mine, meaning the Holy Spirit will take from the Son. And he also used the fact that the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of the Father and the Son. Right in Romans 8, 9, we hear that the Spirit is called the Spirit of Christ. This quasi-belonging or possessive case or genitive case used indicates hypostatic origination. St. Hilary is a saint of both East and West. He lived from 310 to 367 AD, and he says the following, quote, Accordingly, he, the Holy Spirit, receives from the Son, who is both sent by him and proceeds from the Father. Now I ask whether to receive from the Son is the same thing as to proceed from the Father. But if one believes that there is a difference between receiving from the Son and proceeding from the Father, surely to receive from the Son and to receive from the Father will be regarded as one and the same thing. End quote. On the Holy Trinity, Book 8, Chapter 20. For our Lord himself says, Because he shall receive of mine, and shall declare it unto you, all things whatsoever the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I, he shall receive of mine, and shall declare it unto you. That which he will receive, whether it will be power, excellence, or teaching, the Son has said must be received from him. And again, he indicates that this same thing must be received from the Father. For when he says that all things whatsoever the Father hath are his, and that for this cause he declared that it must be received from his own, he teaches also that what is received from the Father is yet received from himself, because all things that the Father hath are his. Such a unity admits no difference, nor does it make any difference from whom that is received, which given by the Father is described as given by the Son. End quote. All right. So St. Hilary is asking the question, is proceeding from the Father the same thing as receiving from the Son? St. Hilary says yes. And he says, this will be regarded as one and the same thing. So he believes the Holy Spirit proceeds and receives from both Father and Son. And St. Hilary's justification for this belief is John 16, where we see that the Holy Spirit receives of Christ because the Father has given him all things. Right. St. Hilary even says, quote, he teaches also that what is received from the Father is yet received from himself, because all things that the Father hath are his, end quote. This matches perfectly with our argument. The Father communicates all to the Son except paternity. The Father spirates, therefore the Son spirates. That's exactly what St. Hilary is saying, but he's saying it in the mode of reception. The Holy Spirit receives from the Father and the Son, because the Father gives all things to the Son, including the ability to spirate the Holy Spirit. Objection. St. Hilary does not affirm the filioque. His answer was only about reception, as he said, Quote, surely to receive from the Son and to receive from the Father will be regarded as one and the same thing. Reply to objection. St. Hilary can interchange receive and proceed because they will be regarded as one and the same thing. A divine procession has two correlative terms, the term producing and the term receiving or the produced term. So the Holy Spirit receiving essence from both means he proceeds from both. It's two sides of the same exact coin. That's just a basic understanding of Trinitarian theology. Furthermore, if you deny this, you will have to say that St. Hilary asked a question about procession at first, which he did not at all address in the entire paragraph dedicated to answering that question. And just in case you doubted, St. Hilary says, quote, Concerning the Holy Spirit, I ought not to be silent, and yet I have no need to speak. Still, for the sake of those who are in ignorance, I cannot refrain. There is no need to speak because 
We are bound to confess him, proceeding as he does from father and son. A patre et filio octoribus confitendus. On the Holy Trinity, Book 2, Chapter 29. Now, what St. Hilary says is we are bound to confess him, the Holy Spirit, proceeding as he does from father and son. A patre et filio octoribus confitendus. Now, in medieval Latin, as opposed to classical Latin, the meaning of octor is usually causer, founder, or originator. Octor is a word used more than a dozen times in On the Trinity. In all of these other usages, it always is using the term to pertain specifically to the fact that the father is the son's octor, or origin. So, St. Hilary thinks that the Holy Spirit has both father and son as his octor, or eternal origin. Top Eastern Orthodox apologist Craig Truglia even admits this in his blog. In a comment on his blog, Craig Truglia says, John, I agree with your rendering of the Latin personally which is why I find this passage problematic to the Orthodox. It can certainly be read according to the Roman Catholic view. Granted, Hillary is not clear enough, but I think the simpler explanation given to the stress he puts on the word octor is he is talking about the Spirit's origin. We can use mental gymnastics to say that he's really saying something Orthodox somehow, but this would not be the simplest explanation. So, St. Hillary is a filioquist. What St. Hillary says here perfectly matches what, what he says about the Holy Spirit receiving from both Father and Son. The reason why Father and Son are both originators of the Holy Spirit is because the Holy Spirit receives from both Father and Son, right? This interpretation clearly has more coherence with his body of thought. Elsewhere, we also see St. Hilary use the perfilium formula according to hypostatic origination. On the Trinity, Book 12, 56, he says, quote, Let me in short adore you, our Father, and your Son together with you. Let me win the favor of your Holy Spirit, who is from you, through your only begotten. For I have a convincing witness to my faith who says, Father, all mine are yours, and yours are mine. End quote. So clearly here, he says that the Holy Spirit is from the Father through your only begotten. And so we see St. Hilary both affirm both per filium, or through the Son, and filioque. Right? He says, your Holy Spirit who is from you through your only begotten Son. And he also says, we are bound to confess him proceeding as he does from both Father and Son. And he says the Holy Spirit receives from both Father and Son. So St. Hilary agrees perfectly with the Ecumenical Council of Florence, which says the perfilium formula and the filioque formula are substantially identical, but they highlight different things. Through the Son helps us recognize that the Father communicates the spirit of power to the Son. Filioque helps us recognize that both Father and Son actively spirate or communicate the divine essence to the Holy Spirit. St. Hilary is agreeing with us perfectly. We already showed that St. Augustine, St. Epiphanius, St. Isidore, and St. Hilary all use John 16 to prove the filioque. But let's keep going. There's more. St. Ambrose. He's a saint both east and west. He lived from 340 to 397 AD. In On the Holy Spirit, book 2, chapter 11, verse 118, we see him say, But if you are willing to learn that the Son of God knows all things and has foreknowledge of all, see that those very things which you think to be unknown to the Son, the Holy Spirit received from the Son. He received them, however, through unity of substance, as the Son received from the Father. He, says he, shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall declare it unto you. All things whatsoever the Father hath are mine. Therefore, said I, he shall receive of mine, and shall declare it unto you. What then is more clear than this unity? What things the Father hath pertain to the Son? What things the Son hath, the Holy Spirit also has received. And in On the Holy Spirit, book 2, chapter 12, verse 134, we see, The Son received all things from the Father. For he himself said, All things have been delivered unto me from my Father. Matthew eleven twenty seven. All that is the Father's, the Son also has. For he says again, All things which the Father has are mine. And those things which he himself received by unity of nature, the Spirit by the same unity of nature received also from him. As the Lord Jesus himself declares when speaking of his Spirit, Therefore said I, he shall receive of mine and shall declare it unto you. John sixteen fifteen. Therefore, what the Spirit says is the Son's, and what the Son has given is the Father's. So neither the Son nor the Spirit speaks anything of himself, for the Trinity speaks nothing external to itself. So St. Ambrose affirms the reception is ad intra by way of substance. So St. Ambrose reads John 16 and recognizes that this reception of knowledge is about the imminent life of God by way of substance. So the Holy Spirit's reception of knowledge is from the divine essence, which he receives from the Son through unity of substance, as the Son received from the Father. Clearly, this is talking about hypostatic origin. The way the Son receives knowledge from the Father is by the essence and he receives the essence from the Father. And so if the Holy Spirit receives the knowledge from the Son in the same manner that the Son has received from the Father, this is because he receives the essence from the Son. Now, some people see this and read this as mere consubstantiality. Oh, look, it's just talking about mere unity of substance. This is not just talking about mere consubstantiality, although consubstantiality is part of it. It's talking about consubstantiality by way of reception, right? As the Son received from the Father. And this can't be about mere consubstantiality, because if it was about mere consubstantiality, you could say, oh, the Son receives knowledge from the Holy Spirit. Clearly, we don't see any of the Church Fathers say this. Why? 
because there's actually a taxi or order to the reception of the divine essence. The Father has the divine essence from no one, the Son has it from the Father, and the Holy Spirit has it from the Father and the Son. And that's why we could say the Holy Spirit receives knowledge from both Father and Son. And we say the Son receives knowledge from the Father. But we don't say that the Father receives knowledge from the Holy Spirit. We don't say the Son receives knowledge from the Holy Spirit because they don't have hypostatic origination from the Holy Spirit. Let's see what the great Saint Athanasius has to say about John 16. Quote, On the other hand, the Son sends the Spirit. For if I go, he says, I will send the paraclete. The Son glorifies the Father, saying, Father, I have glorified you. Whereas the Spirit glorifies the Son, who says, He will glorify me. The Son says, Those things which I have heard from the Father are what I speak to the world. While the Spirit in turn receives from the Son, He will take from what is mine, he says, and declare it to you. The Son came in the name of the Father, whereas the Son also speaks of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. Therefore, since the Spirit has the same relation of nature and order with respect to the Son that the Son has with respect to the Father, how can the one who calls the Spirit a creature escape the necessity of thinking the same about the Son? First letter to Serapion. So St. Athanasius makes some interesting parallels. The first thing he notices in the Son to Father relation is that the Son glorifies the Father. Secondly, he notices the Son hears from the Father and declares him. Thirdly, he says the Son comes in the name of the Father. And fourth, he says the Father sends the Son. Now, St. Athanasius is smart and he recognizes that the Spirit to Son relation parallels the Son to Father relation. So in the Spirit to Son relation, he notices first, the Spirit glorifies the Son. Secondly, the Spirit hears from the Son and declares him. Thirdly, the Spirit comes in the name of the Son. And fourthly, the Son sends the Spirit. Now from the parallel between the Spirit to Son relation and the Son to Father relation, St. Athanasius draws the following conclusion. Quote, The Spirit has the same relation of nature and order with respect to the Son that the Son has with respect to the Father. Whoa. St. Athanasius is a filioquist. So what is the Son's relation of nature and order to the Father? Well, the Son receives essence from the Father, and he's ordered posterior according to taxis to the Father, right? The Father is the first person, and the Son is the second person. Well, if the Spirit has the same relation of nature and order with respect to the Son that the Son has with respect to the Father, what does that mean? That means the Spirit receives essence from the Son, and he's ordered posterior to the Son, according to taxis. And that's why the Holy Spirit is a third person due to the filioque. So it is clear that St. Athanasius supports and believes in the filioque, and he deduces it from verses from John 16. Furthermore, we remember that Photius says that we can't say that the Holy Spirit receives from the Son because that will imply the filioque. But St. Athanasius is doing that very thing. He's saying that the Holy Spirit receives from the Son and has the same relation of nature and order to the Son as the Son has to the Father. This is because he affirms the filioque. And in case you didn't believe that, let's go even further. St. Athanasius in Discourse 3 against the Arians, chapter 28, paragraph 44 says, quote, First, that if the Spirit knew, much more must the Word know, considered as the Word, from whom the Spirit receives. End quote. Wait a second. So the Spirit receives knowledge from the Son? But knowledge is only received by the communication of the Divine Essence, not through the energies nor by economic procession. So if the Spirit is receiving knowledge from the Word, that's because he's receiving the Divine Essence, which is pure intellect, from the Word. And remember what St. Augustine said. He says, of whom he has essence, of him he has knowledge, from him, therefore, he has hearing. But St. Athanasius says that the Holy Spirit has knowledge from the Son. That means he has essence from the Son. And that can only be by way of hypostatic origination. Furthermore, St. Athanasius in Discourse 3 Against the Arians, chapter 25, paragraph 24 says, quote, For he, as has been said, gives to the Spirit, and whatever the Spirit has, he has from the Word. End quote. Everything the Spirit has, he has from the Son. Why? because the Spirit has the divine essence and receives all the divine attributes from the Son. Clearly, St. Athanasius is a filioquist, and he used John 16 to prove his belief as well. So we show that St. Augustine, St. Hilary, St. Athanasius, St. Ambrose, St. Isidore, and St. Epiphanius used John 16 to prove the filioque, and many of them made the same argument we made. Now that we have shown that this interpretation of John 16 is clearly orthodox, we shall theologically examine argument one and debunk all the common objections to the filioque. So, revisiting our argument, here is our argument with the implicit premises explicitly stated. Premise 1. The Father communicates all to the Son except for paternity. The Father has a spiration. Spiration is not paternity. Therefore, the Father communicates spiration to the Son. If spiration is communicated to the Son, then the Spirit proceeds from the Son. Therefore, the Spirit proceeds from the Son. Premises 1 and 3 are the contested premises. Premise 1 says, the Father communicates all to the Son except for paternity, and premise 3 is, spiration is not paternity. These are the two premises that Eastern Orthodox apologists would deny. The first objection comes from St. Gregory Nazianzen, Oration 34, verse 10, which says, quote, 
But if all that the Father has belongs likewise to the Son, accept causality, end quote. So Eastern Orthodox apologists will quote this and say, look, premise one says the Father communicates all to the Son except for paternity. We should change this to the Father communicates all to the Son except causality. So the Father and the Son are not both causes of the Holy Spirit or principles of the Holy Spirit. Rather, the Father alone is cause or principle of the Holy Spirit. Now let's examine the underlying motivation for why St. Gregory Nazianzen says all that the Father has belongs likewise to the Son except causality. So we could tackle with the logic and theology behind the quote and show why it's right or wrong. The first interpretation of St. Gregory's claim is that we need to maintain the hypostatic properties of the persons, right? The persons must be distinguished by hypostatic properties to actually be distinct from each other. The Father cannot communicate a hypostatic property to the Son or else there will be no distinction between Father and Son. And some think that St. Gregory thinks that causality or origin of the processions of the persons is a hypostatic property of the Father. So the spiration of the Spirit cannot be communicated to the Son, otherwise there's no distinction between Father and Son. Or in other words, the Son becomes the Father. Alright, let's examine this. Does the filioque lead to no distinction between Father and Son? The answer is clearly no. Why? This is because the Father is still unbegotten and actively generates, whereas the Son is begotten. That which is unbegotten cannot be that which is begotten. That which actively generates cannot be that which is generated. So there's this irreducible distinction between the persons. Whether or not there's a common notion of active spiration does not affect the distinctions of persons, because the Father would still be distinct from the Son, and the Son would still be distinct from the Father. So they would still be unique, distinct persons, even if the filioque were true. So one cannot say that the filioque collapses the distinctions of the persons, since they would still be differentiated. So the argument that the filioque makes the father and the son indistinguishable is clearly false and should not be a motivation to reject the filioque. Objection! This makes the son into a father. Wrong once again. The term father is relative to the term son. To be a father only necessitates a son, since these are relations of opposition. The claim that the production of the Holy Spirit makes the son into the father implies that the production of the Holy Spirit is a sufficient condition for fatherhood. In other words, you are making the Holy Spirit into a son and saying the Father could be Father just by spirating the Holy Spirit without generating the Son, which is false. It's a simple reductio ad absurdum. If the Son becomes a Father just by spirating without generating a Son, then the condition of fatherhood is fulfilled in just spiration. But that just means the Father could be Father just by spirating. But the condition of fatherhood is having a Son. So you have just made the Holy Spirit into a Son by this objection. So if you were consistent with the logic used in this objection, you'd be making the Holy Spirit into the Son which means you're certainly wrong. Objection. Spirating the Holy Spirit is the Father's hypostatic property. False. The Father has a productive power of the entire Godhead because he's unbegotten and the first person. However, communicating the spiration in no way takes away from his hypostatic property of being unbegotten source of the Godhead. If the communication is a perfect communication, we think that the Father's hypostatic properties are being unbegotten and generating his Son. The fact that he is a source of life in the Godhead comes from the fact that he is unbegotten or from no other. We can still distinguish the persons even with the filioque. Even St. Gregory Nazianzen affirms the Father's hypostatic property as being unbegotten. In Oration 25, he says, quote, Teach also that we must not make the Father subject to another source, lest we posit a first of the first, and thus overturn the divine existence. Nor should we say that the Son or the Holy Spirit is without source, lest we take away the Father's special characteristic. End quote. So the Father's special characteristic is that he's without source or unbegotten. The filioque does not make the Son unbegotten. Furthermore, St. Gregory Nazianzen in Oration 25 affirms that fatherhood is constituted by the generation of the Son. He says, quote, Rather, teach that the Father is truly a Father, much more truly even than human fathers are, because he is a Father uniquely and distinctively, in a way different from corporeal beings, unique being without a mate, of one who is unique, namely the only begotten, only a Father, since he was not formerly a Son, completely a father, and father of one who is complete, which is not clear with us, and father from the beginning, since he did not become a father at a later point in time." End quote. So St. Gregory Nazianzen affirms that the father is truly a father because he is a father uniquely and distinctively of one who is unique, namely the only begotten. So in other words, the father is a father because he generates the son. Exactly the same point we're making. So just as we confirmed earlier, spiration is not the father's hypostatic property. The unique characteristic of the Father is that he's unbegotten and that he generates the Son. Fatherhood is grounded in being unbegotten and act of generation. Now the second interpretation that Eastern Orthodox make of St. Gregory Nazianzen's quote from Oration 34 is that he's trying to preserve the monarchy of the Father 
Maybe St. Gregory thinks that causality or origin of the processions of the person is unique to the Father, meaning the Father is the source of life of the Godhead, and he wants to preserve this. Now the Catholic Church's dogma of the Filioque, defined at the Council of Florence, actually preserves the monarchy, so source of the Father. Even the top Eastern Orthodox apologist Cabane admits the Filioque does not destroy the monarchy of the Father. Catholics would say, well, then why does the East object? Because we still preserve the monarchy of the Father. And it's true that Rome preserves the monarchy of the Father, and anybody who says otherwise doesn't know what they're talking about. And anybody who says otherwise doesn't know what they're talking about. The Father is still the sole source of the deity, as he is the only one who is unbegotten. The Son has communicated the numerically identical spirit of power of the Father, and does not have his own emergent power, as if something in the Godhead that was lacking was suddenly gained. Both Latins and Greeks affirm that the Father is the source of life in the Godhead. We just believe the Father communicates the identical spirit of power to the Son, and they actively spire together. But this in no way takes away from the Father being the font of life in the Godhead. The Father and the Son are not two sources of spiration, but one common source of spiration. The Father is a source in an underivative manner. The Father communicates the numerically identical spirative power to the Son, and so both Father and Son spirate with the same spiration. The Father is the source of life in the Godhead or font of the entire deity because he's unbegotten and the source of the processions, the divine productions. And anybody who says otherwise doesn't know what they're talking about. Objection. Is the Father's spiration lacking? Right, so a lot of Eastern Orthodox will make this claim and ask us, why must you say the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son? Does this mean the Father's spiration is lacking? No, the Father's spiration is not lacking. The reason the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son is not because the Father needs the Son to supplement his spiration, but because the Father gives all to the Son, except for paternity. Spiration is not paternity, therefore the Son spirates. The Son's spiration is identical to the Father's, not a copy that is similar, but the same exact spiration. The only difference is that the Son has communicated the spirit of power from the Father, whereas the Father has the spirit of power in himself. Objection! The Filioque leads to subordination within the triad. Claim. The Father and Son spirating subordinates the Holy Spirit making him lesser than both. The objection's reasoning is as follows. The Holy Spirit is lacking the spirit of power, meaning he's ontologically lesser than the two who have it. Now, if the productive powers leads to an inequality within the Godhead, by that logic, the Father would not be equal to the Son or the Holy Spirit, since he has the productive power of the persons, which they lack. That would mean that under the Eastern Orthodox view, they cannot say the persons are co-equal, since the Father would be ontologically greater than both for having powers neither have. So if the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit can be co-equal, even if the Father has productive powers, which the others lack, then the productive powers do not make the persons ontologically greater or lesser. Thus the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit will still be co-equal if both the Father and the Son spirate the Holy Spirit, since this productive power does not ontologically differentiate their co-equality as regards their glory, honor, and power. So this objection, as advocated by Photius, is debunked as well. If Photius was consistent and prayed the rosary, he would realize the absurdity of his claims. Now, I could already anticipate the Eastern Orthodox apologists making the objection, but wait, we see scripture say, the Father is greater than I. You do believe in Nicene Orthodoxy, don't you? The Father is greater than I has two interpretations by the church fathers. The first one is that it's said of Christ according to his humanity, right? Since Christ is one person with two natures, his human nature is lesser to the Father's divine nature because his human nature is created, whereas the divine nature is uncreated. This is the common interpretation by modern theologians, Latin fathers, and the Athanasian Creed. The second interpretation is that this is said not in a manner which disrupts equality of glory and honor of the persons, rather it is said regarding the order of origins of the persons. The Father is the first person in the Godhead due to his inascability and is greater according to order of origin to both, not temporally, since they proceed from him. Anyone who says the filioque leads to subordinationism needs to stop reciting their favorite online apologists and actually use their own reason to see what such an objection entails. If the spirit of power makes the Son greater than the Spirit, then the Eastern Orthodox cannot maintain the Father's equal to the Son and Spirit, since he has the productive powers which they lack. So if you were consistent with the objection, you would subordinate the Son and the Spirit. Now clearly this is heretical. So if you believe in Nicene Orthodoxy, you believe all three persons are co-equal. And they're all co-equal despite the fact that the Father has the productive powers which some of the other persons lack. And if this is the case, then we know the productive powers do not increase or diminish the ontological greatness of the persons. We'll get into more why this is the case afterwards, later, when we talk about the notional predicates. But for now, this will suffice. Objection. Either it's common to all three or unique to one. Eastern Orthodox apologists will attempt to say that the Father and Son cannot share a common notion, or that will undermine the Trinity. They say that there are two modes of predication. You have things that are hypostatic or apply to a single individual person, or you have things that are essential that apply to all three persons. Now the difference is, Latin Trinitarian theology is more complex and more developed, so we have the idea of the notional predicates, and this emerges from the taxis of persons. We'll get more into this later, but 
we believe that there are two modes of predication, absolute and relative predicates. Absolute predicates apply to all three persons. Relative predicates apply to either one or two persons. Relative predicates emerge from the taxis of persons and their hypothetic origination. And because there's a taxis of persons, we can have notional predicates which apply to two persons. But before we get into this deep theology, let's recognize that the Eastern Orthodox admit a common notion between the Father and the Son in their doctrine of eternal manifestation or energetic procession. Gregory Palama says, quote, The eternal joy of the Father and the Son is the Holy Spirit, since he is common to both with respect to his use. So we see that the Holy Spirit is common to both, and he's the eternal joy of both. And so we have something that's a shared notion between Father and Son. But then the Eastern Orthodox will reply and say, well, this is a common notion, but not a common hypostatic property. Awesome, that's what we've been saying. Active spiration is not a hypostatic property. It's only a common notion. Only passive spiration, the Holy Spirit receiving the divine essence from the Father and the Son, is a hypostatic property in our theology. Now, what is the proper interpretation of Oration 34? When St. Gregory Nazianzen says, all that the Father has belongs likewise to the Son, except causality, the term he uses is etias, which for him means principal causality. The Father alone has principal causality, meaning he has the productive powers in an underivative manner, right? Even St. Augustine draws a distinction between principal causality and the Son's causality of the Spirit. We see him say, The Father alone is he from whom the Word is born, and from whom the Holy Spirit principally proceeds. And therefore I've added the word principally, because we find that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Son also, but the Father gave him this too. What does he mean by this? Well, St. Augustine is recognizing that the Father is the principal cause of the Holy Spirit in the sense that he has the spirative power of the Holy Spirit in an underivative manner, whereas the Son has communicated the spirative power from the Father. But they both actively spirate the Holy Spirit. And that's why we see earlier that St. Augustine says that the Holy Spirit receives essence from the Son and that the Holy Spirit proceeds from both at the same time. Likewise, when St. Gregory Nazianzen is saying that the Father communicates all to the Son except causality, our interpretation of that is that he's talking about principal causality. So although both actively spirate the Holy Spirit, and therefore we believe in the Filioque, only the Father has the spirative power in an underivative manner. Later in this video, we will further substantiate this thesis, the distinction between the Son's causality and principal causality, and we will show that the Church Fathers, both Latin and Greek, teach it. In Oration 41, Chapter 9, we see St. Gregory Nazianzen says, All that the Father has, the Son has also, except the being unbegotten. Right? That matches perfectly with premise one, which says, The Father communicates all to the Son except paternity. All that the Father has, the Son has also, except the being unbegotten. And that's because being unbegotten is the reason why the Father is the monarch of the Godhead, or has the productive powers underivatively, whereas the Son is communicated this productive power derivatively. And so we revisit the argument. Premise one, the Father communicates all to the Son except for paternity. The Father has the spiration. Spiration is not paternity. Therefore, the Father communicates spiration to the Son. If spiration is communicated to the Son, then the Spirit proceeds from the Son. Therefore, the Spirit proceeds from the Son. We show that the Father communicates all to the Son except for paternity. We show that the Father has the spiration. We know that spiration is not paternity, as the Father is Father by generating a Son. Therefore, the Father communicates spiration to the Son. If spiration is communicated to the Son, then the Spirit proceeds from the Son. Therefore, the Spirit proceeds from the Son. This is the same argument used at the Ecumenical Council of Florence. From the bull, from July 6, 1439, we see, quote, And since all that the Father has, the Father himself in begetting, has given to his only begotten Son, with the exception of fatherhood, the very fact that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Son, the Son himself has from the Father eternally, by whom he was begotten also eternally, end quote. And we see St. Cyril of Alexandria make this exact argument from John 16. On the Gospel according to John, Book 11, Chapter 1, he says, quote, But it is because he is consubstantial with the Son, and divinely proceeds through him. In this way, then, the statement that his Spirit receives something from the Only Begotten is wholly unimpeachable, and cannot be cavilled at. For proceeding naturally as his attribute through him, and having all that he is in its entirety, he is said to receive that which he has. End quote. And he also makes this argument in Tome 4 against Nestorius. Quote, All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore I said unto you, that of mine shall he take, and declare it unto you. For as the Holy Ghost proceedeth out of the Father, being his by nature, in equal wise is he through the Son himself too, his naturally and consubstantial with him. End quote. Right? The Father communicates all to the Son, the Father spirates, therefore the Son spirates. We show that the Holy Spirit receives knowledge from the Son, and therefore receives the divine essence from the Son, as we debunk the essence-energy's real distinction, 
and therefore energetic procession and eternal manifestation. We show that the Son's reception of authority and the Son's reception of speech, knowledge, and action from the Father indicated that he was begotten of the Father. Likewise, we show that the Holy Spirit has the same reception of speech, action, and knowledge from the Son, indicating that he proceeds or receives divine essence from the Son. We showed St. Athanasius, St. Hilary, St. Ambrose, St. Augustine, St. Epiphanius, St. Isidore, all using John 16 to prove the filioque, and some of them making our very exact argument. Then we answered all the common objections to the filioque and showed that they are wrong. And then we made a clarification on what St. Gregory Nazianzen meant when he said that everything belongs to the Son except for causality. This he meant principal causality. And so we see this argument works and it fits with scripture and the church fathers. Now we're going to make a second argument that is similar to this. And it comes from the doctrine of relations of opposition. We already showed that the church fathers unanimously taught the doctrine of relations of opposition. So if the basis for the real distinctions between the persons exists based on relative opposition, as we have shown from the church fathers and from philosophy, then that must mean that for the Holy Spirit to be really distinct from the Son, there has to be relative opposition between the two. So this means either the Son produces the Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit produces the Son. There has to be some sort of relative opposition, but the Holy Spirit does not produce the Son, therefore the Son produces the Holy Spirit. We shall now go on to the notional actions and the imminent divine processions and explain how the Father can communicate spiration to the Son. All right, now to understand the divine processions, we use the psychological analogy to help give us insight. The Father is always knowing and willing through his essence and through the infinite fecundity of his vital operation of knowing. He produces a perfect word, which has communicated the numerically identical pure act as himself. The only distinction is this relation of opposition. The word is generated, whereas the father's ungenerated. They are the exact same pure act, not mere copies, but identical pure act of existence. Therefore, there's unity in essence. But the word and the father are really distinct by this incommunicable, irreducible directness towards each other, which we call a relation of opposition. And that simply means the father who is ungenerated cannot be the one who is generated due to the principle of non-contradiction. So they are distinct whose, but the same what. All right, the father and the son are the same pure act, and they have the exact same vital operations of knowing and willing. But the infinite fruitfulness of the imminent knowing is exhausted in the generation of the son. And so the son does not produce another son. But we know that the infinite fruitfulness of the divine will is not exhausted in the generation of the son. So the father and the son share the same exact infinite fruitfulness of the imminent will, and therefore, together, they spirate or breathe forth a love product. That is the Holy Spirit, the kiss of the Father and the Son, or their blossom of charity. Now, since the Holy Spirit is communicated the same exact pure act through the mode of operation of, of the imminent will, he knows and wills with the exact same knowing and willing of the Father and the Son. But the distinction is that he receives the divine essence as spirated and as a third person. So the infinite fecundity of both knowing and willing are exhausted, for lack of a better term. So he does not generate or spirate any persons. Now we must draw a distinction between the notional action of generation and spiration and the essential operation of knowing and willing. So although Father, Son, and Holy Spirit both know and will, only Father generates because the divine fecundity of the knowing is exhausted in the generation of the Son. And only the Father and the Son spirate because the divine fecundity of the imminent will is exhausted in the spiration of the Holy Spirit. And so all three persons know and will with the exact same knowing and willing. Only Father generates the Son, and only Father and Son spirate the Holy Spirit. Now we must abstract out any imperfections from the psychological analogy. The first being temporal succession. In the psychological analogy, we proceeded from Father, then to Son, and then to Holy Spirit. Now clearly, there's no temporal succession in the divine processions, as each person is co-eternal. The Father's always knowing and always generates the Word, and the Holy Spirit's always breathed forth by both Father and Son. Furthermore, since the divine processions are the communication of pure act, there's no transition of potency to act, right? A transition of potency to act would not be the communication of pure act. That would be the communication of an act potency composite. So the divine processions are just pure act from pure act, or God from God, light from light. And in fact, there's no transition at all, because a transition implies a state of non-being. So there's no true causation or dependency. And this is why in John 5, 26, we see... For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself, right? The Father has a seity, and he has given the Son a seity. Now this seems counterintuitive at first, because it seems as if giving someone a seity requires a dependency relation. 
But if the father is communicating pure act to the son, that means the father and son are the exact same pure act, and there's no transition of potency to act, so there's no true dependency relation. In other words, the divine essence simply is existence, and the son has communicated the divine essence, and therefore he has existence within himself. So he's pure subsistent existent itself. So he's all say according to essence. All right, so once we abstract out all of the imperfections from the psychological analogy, all that is left is pure act with subsistent relations from the two vital operations of knowing and willing. So what does subsistent mean? Well, subsistent just means self-maintaining. Because each relation is identical to pure act, they are all asse, so they're subsistent. And the four relations are active generation, passive generation, active spiration, and passive spiration. Now, each one of these relations is simply identical to pure act, meaning active generation is pure act, passive generation is pure act, active spiration is pure act, and passive spiration is pure act. And they are all the exact same pure act due to divine simplicity. Whatever is in God is God. Now, there could still be a real distinction between these relations by way of relative opposition. In other words, that which actively generates cannot be that which is passively generated. This is irreducible mutual reference of one to the other, allowing us to have each person be fully identical to God without allowing for composition in the Godhead while still maintaining a real distinction between the persons. And because of this, we have to have the filioque. For the Son and the Holy Spirit to be different persons, they have to have relative opposition, meaning either the Son produces the Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit produces the Son. Now clearly, the Holy Spirit does not produce the Son, therefore the Son produces the Holy Spirit. And so from these four real relations, only three of them are really distinct. And these three really distinct subsistent relations are the persons, right? Active generation, that's the Father, the one who begets. Passive generation, that's the Son, the one who's generated and passive spiration, the one who spirated, that is the Holy Spirit. And so although they are all the same exact pure act, there's a real distinction between them due to this relative opposition or mutual simultaneous directedness against each other. And so this is why the Father and the Son spirate with the same spiration, because there's no relative opposition between active generation and active spiration and passive generation and active spiration. And so they spirate with the exact same spiration. Objection! The Bible only says the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, Read John 15, 26. John 15, 26. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth, ek peruatai, from the Father, he shall testify of me. Catholicism debunked. If only it was that easy. This is sola scriptura level logic. That's like saying, look, 2 Timothy 3, 16 says all scriptures God breathe. Therefore, sola scriptura is right. Proving a shared belief does not refute a claim. Protestants hold that scripture alone is infallible. Catholics and Orthodox hold that scripture is infallible and the magisterium is infallible. Claiming that scripture is infallible does not prove Protestantism. Both Catholics, Orthodox, and Protestants affirm scripture is infallible. Proving a shared belief is not what determines whether or not a position is true. The status of whether the magisterium is infallible is what determines which position is correct. Another example of this faulty logic could be seen in this following example. Imagine you make the claim, Bob is only wearing a blue shirt. And I make the claim, Bob is wearing a blue shirt and blue pants. Now, if we see Bob and he's wearing a blue shirt, that doesn't prove either of our claims, right? Both of our claims affirm this. It could be the case that Bob is wearing a blue shirt and blue pants. It could be the case that Bob is wearing a blue shirt and black pants. So either claim could be true. You must demonstrate the pants is blue or not blue to determine which claim is true. Now, revisiting the objection. We see the Eastern Orthodox hold that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father alone. The Catholics believe the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. John 15, 26 affirms the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. Now, both Catholics and Orthodox affirm the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. Both claims affirm this. This does not refute or prove either claim. To prove the Eastern Orthodox position, you must show either the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father alone, or the Holy Spirit does not proceed from the Son. Just showing the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father does not prove the Eastern Orthodox position. Objection. Well, okay, you are right, but there is no evidence that the Holy Spirit also proceeds from the Son. Therefore, no one should believe it. There is only evidence for the procession of the Holy Spirit from the Father, so we should only affirm that. We already showed proof for the filioque from John 16, but since you are obstinate, we shall give more proof. Argument number 2, Revelation 22.1 and he showed me a river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. So we see the river of water of life proceeds from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Now if we go to John 7, 38 to 39, we see, He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit. So we see the rivers of living water is equivalent to the Holy Spirit. Who is the Lamb? 
In John 1.29 we see, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God. So it is clear here that the Son of God, aka Jesus, is also the Lamb of God. Now if we go back to Revelation 22.1, which says, And he showed me a river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. So the river of water of life proceeds from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Since the river of water of life is the Holy Spirit, Revelation 22.1 translates to the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Lamb, aka the Son. So the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. Objection! This is talking about economic or temporal procession not hypostatic origination. Well, the word for proceeding in Revelation 22.1 is ekpuruamanon. The term ekpuruamanon, when used in context of multiple divine persons, is about theology proper, or about the imminent trinity, meaning this verse should be read as regarding hypostatic origin. If you reject this fact, then you also undermine your basis for reading John 15.26 as regarding hypostatic origin, since you could just say that the term used in John 15.26 is also regarding economic procession. The usage of ekpruamanon in Revelation 22.1 matches perfectly with the Greek Nicene Creed, which says the Holy Spirit proceeds ekpruamanon from the Father. The term used in John 15.26 is the same exact word, but in a different case than that of the Nicene Creed. The term uses ekpruatai. So the Greek Nicene Creed says ektu patros ekpruamanon. Revelation 22.1 says ekpruamanon ektu. So in God's divine foreknowledge, he even vindicated the filioque, by inspiring the Holy Fathers of Nicaea to use the term that best matches with the true procession of the Holy Spirit, ekpruamanon, absolutely vindicating the filioque. Now the question is, is ekpruamanon hypostatic or not? If you say yes, then you're led to the fact that Revelation 22.1 is about hypostatic procession. And if it's about hypostatic procession, then the Holy Spirit hypostatically proceeds from the Father and the Son, meaning the filioque is true. Now if you say no, then John 15.26 is now undermined, because the only reason you thought John 15.26 was about hypostatic procession was because of the term ekpruatai. Now some might try to say, well, look, John 15, 26 makes the distinction between economy and theology because it says, I will send the Holy Spirit and then he proceeds from the Father. Therefore making a distinction between economic and imminent processions. This relates to economic procession. What is that? The Holy Spirit being sent to creation. This relates to the Holy Spirit getting his hypostatic existence from the Father in the manner of proceeding from the essence of the Father. The only problem with this is that there's actually synonymous parallelism going on. The two are meant to mutually inform each other, not to be put in contrast. So now you don't have any basis for reading John 15, 26 as hypostatic. But that means both John 15, 26 and Revelation 22, 1 are economic processions. But then if the Bible only has stuff about the economic processions of the Holy Spirit, the only way to know the imminent processions is by the economy then. But if the only way to know about the imminent processions is by the economic processions, then that means the economy reflects the imminent trinity, proving the filioque is true, right? And it makes sense that the economy reflects the imminent trinity. We have this saying that action manifests being. You hear all these Eastern Orthodox apologists when it comes to Christology make the same argument. Action reveals being. Action manifests being. But for some reason, they think that the divine actions in the economy does not reveal the imminent divine being. They divorce the economy from the imminent trinity because they know it will lead to the filioque. We'll prove the economy reflects the imminent trinity in argument 5 and answer common objections against it. A lot of times you hear the fact that, oh wait, didn't the Holy Spirit conceive of Christ? Does that mean that the Son is born of the Holy Spirit? Or they'll say, look, the Holy Spirit consecrates the Eucharist. Does that mean that the Son proceeds from the Holy Spirit? No. The reason they don't understand this is that they don't understand the different ways to read the economy back into the imminent trinity. We have the doctrine of divine sendings, divine appropriations, divine missions, so forth. But they don't have these nuanced distinctions. They hear this general axiom that the economy reflects the imminent trinity, but they don't read things properly according to Latin Trinitarian theology. Regardless of whether or not you believe Ekpuruamanan is about hypostatic origin, whether you're consistent or not, you will be led to the filioque. All roads lead to Rome. All right, fine, I'll grant you that, but it still says the Holy Spirit proceeds from the throne, not from the persons, but from the throne. Time to understand basic symbology. The throne represents the one shared authority the Father gives to the Son, not merely a physical throne, although in John's vision there might have been a physical throne to communicate the uncreated reality, but revealing the uncreated reality is the intent behind the physical reality in the vision. Mark 14.62 says, And Jesus said, I am, and ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power, and coming in the clouds of heaven. Sitting on the right hand of power is symbolic of the co-equality between Father and Son. Likewise, the throne is symbolic of the shared authority of Father and Son. So proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb is trying to communicate that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the shared authority or spirit of power of both Father and Son. Notice how it says proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb and not the thrones. This proves there is one common source of the procession, one throne. Yet this one source is from two persons, Father and Son. This perfectly matches with the definition at Florence. 
there's one common principle of inspiration, father and son. Not two sources, but one. So Revelation 22, 1, which reads, And he showed me a river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb, perfectly matches with the Council of Florence. Revelation 22, 1 says the Holy Spirit proceeds from one source, or one throne. The Council of Florence says the Holy Spirit proceeds from one source, one common inspiration. Revelation 22, 1 says the Holy Spirit proceeds from two persons, God and Lamb. The Council of Florence says the Holy Spirit proceeds from two persons, Father and Son. Revelation 22.1 says this is about hypostatic origin, ek pruamanan. The Council of Florence says this is about hypostatic origin, filioque. Revelation 22.1 maintains the monarchy of the Father, the throne of God and of the Lamb. It's the Father's throne first and foremost, but the Lamb shares it because the Father has given it to the Lamb. The Council of Florence preserves the monarchy of the Father. The spirit of power is the Father's, and he has it underivatively because he's unbegotten. Yet he communicates it to the Son, who has it derivatively. Yet they share one common inspiration, one numerically identical inspiration. And so we see Revelation 22.1 perfectly matches with the Council of Florence, and the term used in the Greek Nicene Creed is the exact same term used in Revelation 22.1. It's not a mere coincidence that the God-breathed scriptures match perfectly with the doctrine as defined at the Council of Florence. Christ established the Catholic Church on St. Peter and gave him the keys to the kingdom. The filioque was bound on earth and in heaven, which is why it matches perfectly. So, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son by one source, because all that the Father has is given to the Son, which is represented by the throne of the Father and the Son. This perfectly ties back to argument one. The Father communicates all to the Son except paternity, the Father spirates, therefore the Son spirates. Okay, but this is a novel interpretation. No church father has interpreted this verse in this way, so you're wrong. Not all scripture has to be previously interpreted by the church fathers. If you believe all scriptures need to be previously interpreted by the church father to be true, then you undermine the fact that scripture is God-breathed. Scripture is true even without the church fathers. However, we should obviously respect the consensus of the fathers. Furthermore, let's use a simple reductio ad absurdum. If scripture is only true because it's interpreted by a church father, this means that each church father's interpretation had to be preceded by some previous church father, going all the way back to the apostles. And that means that the apostles' immediate interpretation contained 100% of the meaning of the scripture and that nothing more could be gained from the God-breathed scripture. Meaning all true interpretations throughout all church history were known to the apostles. This is obviously false. Not even the apostles knew all possible interpretations of scripture, since the true author is the omniscient God, the Holy Spirit, who reveals the interpretations of scripture throughout time. Again, we respect and reverence the church fathers and do not go against the consensus of the fathers, but that doesn't mean theology stops with the church fathers. That aside, St. Ambrose says, quote, and this again is not a trivial matter that we read that a river goes forth from the throne of God. This is certainly the river proceeding from the throne of God, that is the Holy Spirit, whom he drinks who believes in Christ, as he himself says, If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. He that believes in me, as says the scripture, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spoke he of the Spirit. John 7, 37-38. Therefore, the river is the Spirit. End quote. On the Holy Spirit, Book 3, Chapter 20. Andrew of Caesarea is a bishop of Caesarea from 563 to 637 AD. Wikipedia says his commentary is identified as the earliest Greek patristic commentary on the Apocalypse or the Book of Revelation. In his commentary on the Apocalypse, he says, quote, The river of God, having been filled with waters running through the heavenly Jerusalem, is a life-giving spirit which proceeds from God the Father and through the Lamb, through the midst of the most supreme powers, which are called throne of divinity. The Synod of Aiken, 809 AD, we have St. Addo of Vienne using Revelation 22.1 to prove the filioque. In Howard's book, The Schism Between the Oriental and Western Churches, with special reference to the addition of the filioque to the Creed, page 26, we see, quote, John, who inquired whether the Holy Spirit may be said to proceed from the Son in the same manner as he proceeds from the Father, St. Addo of Vienne, who makes this statement, adduces from Revelation 22.1, he showed me a pure river of water of life proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb, as an evident proof of the procession from the Father and the Son. End quote. Although there aren't that many commentaries on Revelation, there are ancient Christians who read Revelation 22.1 as proving the filioque. The third argument for the filioque is the taxis or order of persons. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 28.19 As we see, the Father is the first person, the Son is the second person, and the Holy Spirit is the third person in the Godhead. As we know, all three persons are co-eternal, and so there is no prior or posterior between the persons in the temporal sense. However, there still is an ordering of the persons. We believe that the ordering of the persons is best explained by the order of origination, which is best expressed by the filioque. The Eastern Orthodox also teach the ordering of persons, as Mathoma has demonstrated elsewhere. Side note, go watch Mathoma's theology series. Anyways, it is taught in Metropolitan Philaret's Catechism. Philaret is considered a saint by the Eastern Orthodox, and Wikipedia says that he was the most influential figure in the Russian Orthodox Church for more than 40 years. 
In Philaret's Catechism, he teaches the taxis of persons in question 75. The first person of the Holy Trinity, God the Father, the second person of the Holy Trinity, God the Son, the third person of the Holy Trinity, the Holy Ghost. Here, it is clear that the taxis of persons is something taught both East and West. Furthermore, we have church fathers such as St. Basil who teach the taxis of persons. As therefore the Son stands in relation to the Father, so the Spirit stands in relation to the Son, according to the ordering of the traditional baptismal formula. But if the Spirit is ordered to the Son and the Son to the Father, it is evident that the Spirit is also ordered to the Father. So it is a consensus both East and West that the Father is first, the Son is second, and the Spirit is third. Now let's compare the explanatory power of the different models. The Eastern Orthodox model says the Son and the Holy Spirit have their hypostatic origin from the Father alone. If the Son and the Holy Spirit have origination from the Father alone, why is the Son the second person in the Godhead and the Holy Spirit the third person? Is it just some contingent accident? Could the Son be the third person? There seems to be no logical necessity for the taxis of persons. Objection. Eternal manifestation explains the order of persons. First off, we already debunked the essence energy's real distinction and therefore undermine the basis for eternal manifestation or energetic procession. Now in the Catholic model, we believe the Holy Spirit has hypostatic origination from both Father and Son. So under the filioque, it makes sense that the Son is the second and the Holy Spirit is the third person. This is because the Father is from no one, so he's first. The Son is from the Father alone, so he's second. The Holy Spirit is from the Father and the Son, so he's third. There's a logical necessity for the taxis of persons based on hypostatic origination. And so we see that the Catholic model has greater explanatory power than the Eastern Orthodox model for the taxis of persons. And this is one reason to accept the filioque. We see St. Athanasius say, quote, Since the Spirit has the same relation of nature and order with respect to the Son, that the Son has with respect to the Father. So what is the Son's relation of nature and order to the Father? Well, the Son receives essence from the Father, and he's ordered posterior according to taxis to the Father, right? The Father is the first person, and the Son is the second person. Well, if the Spirit has the same relation of nature and order with respect to the Son that the Son has with respect to the Father, what does that mean? That means the Spirit receives essence from the Son, and he's ordered posterior to the Son, according to taxis. And that's why the Holy Spirit is a third person due to the filioque. So clearly the taxis of persons is based off of the filioque. And St. Gregory of Nyssa, in Against Eunomius, Book 1, Chapter 45, says, Our account of the Holy Ghost will be the same also. The difference is only in the place assigned in order. For as the Son is bound to the Father, and while deriving existence from him, is not substantially after him, so again the Holy Spirit is in touch with the Only Begotten, who is conceived of as before the Spirit's subsistence, only in the theoretical light of a cause. Extensions in time find no admittance in the eternal life. Furthermore, to say the Father spirates the Holy Spirit already presupposes the Father generates. As we already saw earlier, the Father is truly a Father because he is a Father uniquely and distinctively of one who is unique, namely the Only Begotten. So to speak of the Father spirating the Holy Spirit presupposes the Father generates the Son, as the condition for fatherhood is met by generation of the Son. Now if the Son is ordered prior to the Holy Spirit, not temporally, but by priority of origination, and receives the divine fecundity of the imminent will, then he will spire it as well. Hey, if you like this video, pray the rosary and subscribe. This concludes part one of our filioque video. In the next part, we will go over more patristic evidence for the filioque and show that it is something that is rooted in the church fathers both East and West. Thank you, Aria from Microsoft Edge, for having such a lovely voice. And for being able to speak audibly and record your voice even when my parents are asleep two doors down. Peace and blessings.